Welcome, dear listeners, to a podcast that will transport you to a world of magic, mystery, and endless wonder. Join us as we step through the Griffin Door, your one-way ticket to the enchanting universe of Harry Potter. I'm your host, Jonathan Carlin, and I'm thrilled to be guiding you on the spellbinding journey chapter by chapter through the pages of the Wizarding World. But I won't be alone on this adventure. I've brought along my brother, Ben, together we're known as the Super Carlin Brothers over on YouTube. We'll be delving into the captivating world of Harry Potter, exploring the characters, unraveling the mysteries, and discussing all of the hidden gems that make this series a timeless masterpiece. In case you don't know us, we've both spent the last 11 years combing through this story, writing fan theories, filling in plot holes, hunting for hidden connections, and just living and breathing Harry Potter. But you may be surprised to learn that in that time, neither of us has actually read through a hard copy of the book. We use them as references, of course, and the ebooks are valuable tools for our research, but we do almost all of our reading via audio. Book. Yeah, so part of why I'm so excited for this podcast is the fact that we are reading a hard copy of the book. We both got a brand new one. I'm already a few chapters in. I can tell you there is hardly a page I have not made notes on. Like, I cannot believe how many little details keep popping out at me, and I cannot wait to just dive into all of them. Yeah, so whether you're a lifelong fan of the series or a newcomer discovering Hogwarts for the very first time, Through the Gryffindor aims to be a podcast podcast filled with laughter, insights, and of course, endless Potter love. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the secrets behind the Griffin door. Let us begin our journey with the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 1, The Boy Who Lived. Oh man, I got chills a little bit. Oh, I know. I'm like so. I was like a little bit nervous going through all that. Like we're we're really starting. I feel like we've been talking about it forever, and now we're like actually sitting down, recording the show. We're doing the thing. I know it's been it's been nervous excitement all day, which which I think has been um, it's been really wonderful actually because I you know there are, there are so many occasions in life where I'm where I'm. Um, I have apprehension or, yeah. or like, or like anxiety based nerves. Mm-hmm. And, and this has been like, like all day I've sort of like, like I've known, it's almost like, like anticipation for, uh, like, like Christmas morning or something like that. Like, it's like, oh my gosh, like it's, it's actually happening. Today is the day. Um, so I'm, I'm just so, I'm so excited to, to begin. I know. Yeah. We've been, if you're, if you're watching us on YouTube, yeah, we've been, we've been building the set around us for the past couple of weeks. It's been really fun having the little pieces arrive and like, uh, finishing it out. And like, we just got all the lighting situated this morning. We, we recorded everything, got a little test runs in and, uh, now, and I know you were, you were just reading the first chapter just before we sat down to record yeah making yeah. notes yeah you know honestly i know that you've you've been uh you've been ahead of me really like and kind of delving into the story a bit further in advance than i have been and um i think i think like i've almost in the same vein i've almost been like like wanting to to hold on to diving into it for the first time properly and and yeah. like walking into episode one just as fresh as seemingly possible so i've literally i have i have both read the chapter uh and have re-listened to it two times oh wow um, yeah <laughs> so, so you've really done a lot of the boy who lived today yeah so i've spent some time <laughs> with the boy who lived and and, and honestly, like, I can't even tell you, like, uh, it, it almost makes me emotional to talk about it in the first place. Like, just like those, those words put together, the boy who lived, um, are just so vital and important. And like, you know, we, we talked about it a little bit in episode zero, but like, I can just so, uh, firmly go back to our childhood where, um, me and you and our younger brother, Tyler, were all sort of like laid out on our parents' bed and our dad, like cracked the book open and started reading this story to us for you know the very very first time. I know, yeah, I, I I do. I I can I can still remember it. Us just sitting there and like wondering about like who did it, like who's trying to steal the stone, who's working with Voldemort, and it was like a really drawn out process because like um our, we would get like two chapters a week, like one on Saturday night and one on Sunday night. And, exactly. And then yep. we'd have to come back next week to find out what happened. And, you know, maybe if it was a really short chapter, we'd get a little extra one. But our dad was really good about it. He's like a, he's a professional newscaster. So he has like a very good delivery while reading and could do like some voices here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. So, I mean, it was, it was really just like a, a really joyous occasion, something that like, um, and, and more than anything else, I would say it was like the thing, like, like the series in general is like what, 
unlocked reading for me as a young kid. Like, yeah. I, like I almost felt like I had it had been reinforced to me that like reading was something that you were supposed to be aversive to. You know, like right, like, like it's always just homework. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was never supposed to be like the fun thing that you got to do. I know. And, and and I remember, yeah, obviously, eventually, I would like literally carry all of the books with me to school in my backpack. Well, so, you never knew if you might want to read all seven books one day. You never know. You never know. <laughs> just in case, just in case you you crack through it. So I know. I do remember sometimes, like uh, in order to avoid doing homework, I would just read Harry. Potter because in my mind it was like well I'm reading so it's not like I'm doing something like you know um uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not like breaking the rules or anything. I can't. No one could scold me for reading. It's like, what are you surely. doing here? Reading books? Yeah. No, uh, no sir. Just stop reading and do your homework. Like, see that does, that sentence doesn't make sense, does it? Right. Right. Yeah. No. Of course not. So um, anyway, yeah. obviously um, we we have a, a deep love for this story, for these characters, and especially uh, and most importantly, the boy who lived. The so. boy who lived. Yeah. So we've been trying to figure out exactly how we wanted to go through chapter by chapter here. Uh, like, and I think. You you know, there were there were times we thought maybe we'd have like uh, we're, this is a section for short for foreshadowing. This is a section for characters introduced, and this will be a section for that. And like as as I tried to like lay those out and like list them as we read through, it was like it was complicated because so many things were so many at like counter to so many things or were Easter eggs. So and as I was going, it was like maybe maybe the best way to do it is just literally almost go page by page because there's not a page that I did not write on for things that like stood out to me in the book. So um I think maybe we can start we, maybe we can start each chapter kind of give like I think it would be fun also to review the artwork for each chapter because it's also kind of a little iconic. Oh it absolutely um, is yeah. so yeah we'll just give a little a breakdown of what happens in the very first chapter here as we enter the wizarding world. I can tell you that when I first the first time I heard it I had no idea what it was about at all like I didn't know magic was going to happen like when we eventually learned that Harry's a wizard I remember being floored by that despite the fact that wizards show up in the first chapter here oh. and do magic like it didn't occur like, I don't think they use the word wizard until Hagrid tells him he's a wizard, even though people are clearly doing unusual things. Oh, yeah. No, and it, it's even really fascinating on the whole that the, the story itself, you know, like, because I know coming into uh, and discovering Harry Potter, like, I remember finding the book in our house for the first time uh, and picking it up and being like, I don't really think I'm into... Um, magicians and sorcerers and, you know, things like that. Because, of course, you know, in the, the American copy was called the Sorcerer's Stone. And for the most part, almost nobody uh, shy of the, the stone for which the sorcerer name comes from is ever referred to pretty much as a sorcerer. I think there's, there's right. maybe one occasion where, where Dumbledore might be referred to as like the greater Yeah, greatest the greatest sorcerer. sorcerer in the world or something. They have like, maybe it's like one of those titles, the Ministry hands out right like right. Gilderoy Lockhart has later on yeah of course of course yeah. Sorcerer um, Supreme no that's that's Doctor Strange <laughs> <laughs> wrong fandom wrong fandom there you go <laughs> but yeah so um chapter one does does a lot of things it's a fairly unique chapter on the whole even within the realm of the Harry Potter saga even um like even in spite of the fact that it's the first chapter but it's it's one of the very few handful of chapters that is not told through the perspective of um, of Harry. Of Harry. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, it like it is one of the. I, I didn't even. Uh, or it's one of those things I've noticed every single time I read this chapter. But like the uh, you, the reader, are referenced. Yeah. In the first chapter, which is um, fairly unusual as the story unfolds. It also like a lot of times when you watch like the pilot episode of a TV show, there's a lot of like things that like that maybe they thought the characters were going to be like, but then clearly as things have unfolded, like maybe the entire world and story hadn't been fleshed out yet. So like things change and there's a, I feel like there's a bunch of little examples of that, but at the same rate, there's a ton of examples of things that show up in like chapter one that go on to be incredibly important in like book seven. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Or like, yeah. Yep. So I mean, there's, I mean, there yep. is a lot of setup and there's a lot of like, mm, we tried something and it, it went, we did, went a different way. <laughs> right. Right. And, and one of the most miraculous things to me, I think about it is that like almost right out of the gate, you get this great big mystery as to like why was Harry attacked in the first place and why uh, was he capable of surviving that attack? Yep. Um, and, you know, those are things that kind of continue to be mysteries for, for quite some time. But yeah. um, anyway, so chapter one begins and we get the introduction to the uh, to the Dursleys, mm -hmm. who are, of course, just seemingly just the worst, the worst. <laughs> um, I, I think like, you know, it's it's funny a little bit because as I 
as I read through it and you sort of like hear um, like how Mr. Dursley gets ready for work in the morning. Like, I think that there's a reference to the fact that he puts on like his most boring tie, which like is like one of those things where it's like uh, you, you can't help but feel the bias of, of the narrator in this capacity being like, well, certainly Mr. Dursley doesn't think it's the most boring tie in the world. And, right. Or but, else does he? And it's just like he's going out of his way to be mundane. <laughs> well, and that's and that's the question because like, you know, when when you read um, you know, like as as he's getting ready and you're sort of like, you know, getting like the lowdown on like like who this family is and everything, like, you know, even his departure from the house, um, like, you know, he goes and, and kisses his son goodbye, and you know, like like Dudley's kind of throwing like a tantrum and he's like, Oh, little tyke, you know, it's like yeah. it's it's like this is one of those things where it's like you can't really fault them for just being like like non-magical. Like, you know, for the most part, like when you look at the Dursleys, at least, you know, for these first couple of pages, it's sort of like they are living their version of a happy life. You know, it's like right. it's, it's okay if it's not the version that you prefer, but it's like on some level, I'm like, are we being overly harsh on them too quickly when it yeah. seems like they're they just kind of like, you know. Well, I think I think even before Harry arrives, it's pretty clear that they're not like super great. Like, I mean, even like it, like uh, Petunia is introduced as like constantly listening in on the neighbors. That's and, true. And like That's the true. way in which um, Vernon is like judging the people dressed on the street and stuff like that. Like just right away, uh, it, it seems like he. They're like they are very anti anything that is not regular. Yes, and, uh, and not just like uncomfortable by it, but like actively going out of their way to like not like it or to to be bothered by it almost <laughs> right 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 yeah like like anything out of the ordinary yeah. is 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 seen in a in a negative light from them so I, i'm not here to 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 grandstand in and stand in defense of the dursleys or anything like that <laughs> but like you know i'm reading like that first chapter and, and him kissing you know dudley goodbye before he takes off uh for his day at work and i'm like that that is how i left my house this morning <laughs> you right know? like uh i did do that exact same thing before before i left uh sans the the little tight comment but um, otherwise, Click. let's see here. Yeah, you do. You do get to um, Grunnings, where of course Mr. Dursley sells drills, and and I do think right away where you kind of get that feeling that maybe they're they're not the greatest. Is uh, the line specifically says he yelled at five different people, he made several important telephone calls, and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime, <laughs> no, and it's like it's like, it's like really like, just can't wait to get to work and start yelling at people. I know it's like this is this is like one of those things where in my mind I have no ability but to assume that anybody who shows up to work and has to use uh, yelling as like a means to get the job done it is either by uh, absolute sheer necessity like of the volume of the work environment and yelling is just required to right. overtake what it, what the otherwise noise of a, a of a of a loud space could be right um, or or this is somebody who is having their own like internal personal struggles that that like needs to resort to yelling to feel some measure of of control over the the circumstance that they're in it's it is an odd or foreign belief to me to imagine a world where somebody actually uh experiences joy through yelling so that, that right. that's pretty much as soon as i get to the point with like, it's like okay maybe mr dursley maybe maybe Vern isn't the best yeah i know um so even even before that i want to like the the very first sentence that really stood out to me as i'm reading through it is it reads when Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up on the dull gray Tuesday our story starts, there was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest the strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Which, I like the sentence so much because it, this is the one where it says where the dull gray Tuesday our story starts. Like us, we the audience, we're all going together. Right. Like we, you, you the reader are not referenced again as far as I know. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know any other occasion where, where the narrator references yeah. you in any capacity. So but that I'll, is a unique use of the word hour. That is, that is a unique use of the word hour right here. But I also think it's funny because I just looked it up because the day in question is November 1st, 1981. That's right. the, the Potters are attacked on October 31st, 1981 when Harry is a one year old. So it says it's a dull gray Tuesday morning and November uh, 1st, 1991 is actually a Sunday. So it's just like right away. Like that's just not the right, right day of the week. And you totally could have looked that up and I don't know why it's wrong, but the fact that it's wrong, you wouldn't think it's like, yeah, whatever. Just pick and there. I feel like the, the, to me, the reason Tuesday is chosen is because it's the most boring day of the week. It's like, like Monday is of course a terrible day because it's, you know, you have to go back to work, but Tuesday is not even halfway through the work. You know, 
know, at least Monday has the honor of being the start of the week. Tuesday is still the front half of the week and boring. Like, no, no, no. So I think that's why that day in particular was chosen, but it's just the wrong, it's just not what day it was. <laughs> I, I know, yeah, which, which feels like one of those things that would have been easy enough to, to adjust yeah. that. But we'll, we'll, of course, see more of that in the future. Uh, I know, I think we referenced this in episode zero just a little bit, but um, sort of like, uh, obviously, eventually, as they're headed to uh, Hogwarts on the Hogwarts Express each year in September, it's usually, not even usually, it is always September 1st, which I think is also always a Sunday. Yeah, because um, they always get there for the feast, and then the next morning is always Monday and the first day of classes. Right, and it's, it's like kind of like one of those, like, like you know what, yeah. it's, it's easier than, than trying to trying to figure out how to have anything yeah. else. And there's, there is something kind of like glorious and happy and exciting about like the the like sept- September 1st being more of like a, like a fixture rather than like a rotating. Yeah. You know, like something of. they have to deal with. Like, you know, wizards don't have to deal with calendars. Of course, like we just operate, we, we make our own days. Exactly. But like the fact that they get the, the, the day is wrong actually comes into play like three paragraphs later where we're introduced to the first magical character of the entire series. Professor Minerva McGonagall in cat form. Yeah. Watching Privet drive. Um, and Mr. Dursley sees her as a cat reading a map, which like, you don't think about it at the time because when you're reading it the first time, you don't know that the cat is Professor McGonagall and that the as a professor she works at Hogwarts and all of that nonsense. But um, as if you if you like scale it back, the fact of the matter is that it is it is described as being a Tuesday, November first. So. This is well into the start of the school year, and it's just a Tuesday, <laughs> and um, McGonagall is just <laughs> skipping, skipping school. Skipping school. Just skipping class. Like, she should be teaching on this day. What's she doing? Um, and I know it's it's really what I think, what I love so much about this, this tiny mistake is that it's like, you might think, well, sure, but Voldemort just fell the night before, so clearly, like, everyone was given the day off. Like, that's why there's a holiday. And yet, that cannot be true because McGonagall is there to confirm the fact that Voldemort fell with Dumbledore. So if even if, like, someone at the school was the one giving her the day off under the belief that this had been true, that person would still have been Dumbledore because he's her boss. Right, so, right, right. So yep, she wouldn't yep. need to come to the house for confirmation from Dumbledore um, if she'd been given the day off because of the occasion. Um, so I just, I, I think that's really funny. That. No, it, I mean, and, and it is, like, one of the, the age-old questions that we have going on here as well is, is simply, like, that the attack happens on Halloween night, so October 31st. Um, this is, of course, like the entire next day that McGonagall is now present and sitting on the wall mm-hmm. and watching over the Dursleys and trying to get confirmation that what they believe to be true is, in fact, true. And then, of course, it is not until that evening, I believe at midnight, yeah. um, when Hagrid ultimately delivers uh, Harry to the Dursley's front front doorstep. Right, so it's like, where was he all day? Yeah. So, so Hagrid's missing day is, is sort of like one of these, these grand mysteries that yeah. sort of like, it, you know, isn't, isn't totally resolved. I mean, I, I suppose that there's, there's something to be said for the fact that we know um, uh, eventually in the story diving way, way, way down the line that Dumbledore does invoke yeah. some ancient magic in order to provide, um, you know, the, the protection that Harry has at the Dursley's yeah. home. Thanks in part to Petunia, his relationship to Lily um, and therefore like Voldemort cannot touch uh, Harry while he is there. So yeah. it, it is entirely possible that that what is happening here is, is a grand amount of instruction on the part of Dumbledore, you know, who first went to Hagrid and assigned him this mission and told him to essentially tend to Harry for for one whole day uh, while he was able to go through and do all of Dumbledore type things, which is which is essentially like seeing between the lines. Like, he, like yeah. what Dumbledore knows is that like Voldemort is not gone for good and he knows right, right away. He knows right away because he's already aware of the prophecy and stuff like that. So he's like already setting up for Voldemort return like as of this night already yes he's yes. ready for it but there's like there continues to be little things like this that like don't add up because when Dumbledore eventually does arrive later that day um like he talks to McGonagall and uh he confirms with her that oh it must have been Hagrid who told you I'd be here later on and it's like when when did Hagrid tell McGonagall that he was coming to this address? Because McGonagall, when she sees Harry, it's clearly the first time she's seen him. And it's like, but Hagrid goes and gets Harry immediately and presumably has him the entire time. So when did Hagrid run into McGonagall and then McGonagall leaves to go meet up with Hagrid later? <laughs> like, you know, it's like that. 
You know, Jay, the, the, I mean, these are these are the really complicated questions. I mean, uh, on that note, as long, as long as you want to, like, you know, split hairs, the weatherman who's who's speaking in this particular chapter. Jim McGuffin. Yeah, J- Jim McGuffin, <laughs> of course. Good trivia for you. Yeah. Um, also does claim that while he can't uh, ensure something, he is sure that it will be a wet evening. I don't know about that, but it's not the it's not only the owls that have been acting oddly lately today. Let's see here. They have been. Uh, let's see here. They've had a downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. There we go. I got there eventually. Also um, wrong. <laughs> also wrong because it's like there's no mention whatsoever of a, right. of a light drizzle happening yeah. as, as McGonagall and Dumbledore and Hagrid are, right. are leaving baby Harry, who otherwise apparently is in the rain on the front <laughs> know, doorstep right? Other, all night. I know. It's, it's possible it starts raining later in the night, like one or two in the morning, which means they leave him out in the Raid, uh, uh. which is also not great uh, for them. But uh, before they even get there, let's see. There's a few other things that happened during the day. Oh, bonfire night. This is like a, a, a an American versus like European thing. Like we don't have bonfire night. We we do not have bonfire not, night yet. So this is, is yeah, yeah, it's not something that registered. But it's a reference to Guy Fox. To Guy Fox and like um, if you ever see like V for Vendetta, it's like remember, remember the fifth of November, which actually would be. The next week, because it is November first, as he's saying that. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Of course. Yep. So and, that and, is accurate. Right. And and uh, Fox Guy Fox is in fact where um, Fox the Phoenix gets his gets yes. his name from. Yes. Uh, so is that that same person? Other little fun uh, tidbit there. I also love that um, while Vernon is out at work during this day. Uh, this is one of the things that you maybe like skips by you when you're just listening on the audio, but like he overhears someone whispering about the Potters and they're like, yeah, their son, Harry. And he's like, he's never even met his met- nephew. He wasn't even sure his, his nephew was named Harry. It could be Harvey or Harold or something. And I like, I love that one of the names he tries to reassure himself with is Harold, as if Harry is it just a nickname for people named Harold? Yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> it's like we jokingly in office refer to him as Harold Potter all, all the, time, the time. Yeah, as if we're just using like his long form, his long form name there. Yep. Uh, yep. No, I think that's that's another great one. Although interestingly, um, there is the line about how um, the Dursleys had never met their nephew before, which is something that actually does hold up to the continuity pretty well, uh, because at this point in time, the Potters would be um, in hiding. Because That's the, true. The, the prophecy does take place prior uh, to the birth of of both Harry and Neville, the, the two people that the prophecy could in fact refer to. Um, Although, now that you mention it, doesn't Lily in her letter to Sirius mention like a vase or something that came from Petunia? Yes, the, that is in fact a thing. Right. So, and they're in hiding at that point? Well, somehow, some way, Petunia must have had Special, well, well, special well, well, well. circumstances, well, or or well, otherwise, well. maybe Petunia is best friends with Peter Pettigrew, <laughs> <laughs> which somehow seems possible because well, he's dating Pierce Polkus's mom, right? Yeah, yeah naturally. Yeah, yeah. We, we have an entire we rap have a whole about, how, about that. Yeah, about how how Peter Pettigrew possibly has a child, and it is uh, one of Dudley's friends. Uh, Pierce Polkus. Yep. Um, well, that we'll we'll come back to that here. I think in the next couple of chapters as well. Um, other other really cool moments that we do have inside of this chapter are, of course, uh, the line from Dumbledore where he says, "I would trust Hagrid with my life." Oh, yep. Um, this is this is like one of those things where I think it establishes very early on in the story the fact that um, Dumbledore does not practice some of the same prejudices that you may expect within the Wizarding world, even though at this point in time. Um, uh, we don't know that much about Hagrid at all. Um, no, we don't. Other than that, uh, McGonagall is like she seems to be less trustful of Hagrid in this moment. Yes, yes, and and this is this is kind of like one of those interesting things where um, the the trust that Dumbledore does bestow on on Hagrid is is kind of interesting and also. Um, you know, it, it could be argued unexplained, um, you know, as the, the Fantastic Beast series was coming out and uh, beasts were so at the forefront and center of the conversation. Yeah. And, and we knew that at some point in time in that saga, we would we would cross over into when Hagrid would have had his time, um, you know, of course, at school. Mm-hmm. We, we kept operating under the belief that at some point in time, Hagrid is going to have to show up and be relevant to, you know, to to how uh, Gellert Grindelwald. Oh, is yeah, you think defeated. so. 
and and we never we we don't ever we don't ever get you know that ultimate explanation. Yeah, because um, the the final duel between Dumbledore and Grindelwald happens in 1945, and by that point, Tom Riddle has been expelled or has unleashed the Basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets. And Hagrid, and Hagrid has, has, has been expelled. Been expelled so yeah. at some point, like Hagrid has already been like um, at least relevant a relevant student to Dumbledore at that point. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, and, and because he's good with beasts and he immediately hires him back, you'd think he had to have shown up in the Fantastic Beast movies. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So what, what our, our our standing theory there is as to why Dumbledore has always had such trust in Hagrid is that Hagrid must have done something so um like so that that showed such support uh for for the man himself that Dumbledore was like if if he supported me, then he will support me always, and and I will I will have the undying faith in this person in yeah. that, in that regard. Um, however, again, that's all speculation because we we never actually get a, a full blown explanation for no, it. We do not. Um, but I do love that it, it establishes very early, sort of like what Dumbledore's position is going to be. Uh, you know, kind of kind of all throughout that does that does remain true. Um, the other really amazing uh, kind of piece that you and I both have have observed and loved about this particular chapter is the prominence of of three characters in particular all of whom play absolutely vital roles um to harry during his sort of like like you know formative years uh which is of course rubeus hagrid albus dumbledore and mention of sirius black there is yeah which is really interesting because um, i think those are the th it sounds like those are the first three people harry has contact with after the attack it is right yeah, yeah so um sirius shows up he's got yeah so the potters are attacked sirius shows up to the house and he's holding harry that's when hagrid shows up and says give him to me and then hagrid has him presumably all day apparently talks to mcgonagall at some point and tells him he's going to private drive that night apparently <laughs> but apparently who knows um but then later hagrid hands him directly to dumbledore so it goes from sirius to hagrid to dumbledore which is v it is so this is this is like one of the craziest details ever but um a couple of years ago ben and i got invited out to uh, London to visit the um, the British Library where they had this history of magic exhibit yes. on display and it had just like all of like the history behind all of the things you hear about in the wizarding world and by far the coolest thing they had there was this thing called the Ripley scroll which was this like like 23 foot long scroll it's right a, yeah it's like a massive piece of like parchment yeah. that is like beautifully like uh, illustrated and is essentially or or, or supposedly the actual formula in order to create uh, the Philosopher's Stone, right. like, like the real <laughs> thing. So um, not to get too far ahead in, in our story here, but Nicholas Flamel is a is a actual real life human being who lived, I think, in the 14 or 1500s uh, and had supposedly, uh, and of course unconfirmed, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, created or, or sought to create the, uh, the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone, which can turn metals into gold and gives you the elixir of life. Yes. And yeah. And one of the most remarkable elements, you know, just to, to bring us back to uh, Hagrid, Sirius, and uh, Dumbledore here, is that like the the final like three ingredients uh, visible on the actual Ripley scroll, scroll. Again, this is not like a this is not like manufactured for the Wizarding World. This is yeah, a this real is, historical artifact, right? Of, um, of people trying to actually practice alchemy and literally create the Philosopher's Stone, right? And and so the last three ingredients are are uh, visualized as a red orb a black orb and a white orb that come together to create what you ultimately have is the philosopher's stone. Right. And what is unbelievable about this and the moment that we saw it, I mean, like you and I both are, our jaws just kind of like hit the floor because we're like, wait, Rubeus means red. Yeah. And Albus, Albus means white. And Sirius black, black. Uh, gives you gives you those three stones. Those three men are arguably the the closest to surrogate father figures for Harry, uh, and and they're the ones who you know through his life kind of forge him into the the man that he becomes, uh, which right. which sort of brings you to this argument that like Harry Harry who ultimately will eventually become master of death is is sort of equating to the elixir of life, uh, and Harry who is so frequently throughout the story embodied by the color gold, right? Um, you know it's it's like it's like these these three people come together the the red black and white to create the Philosopher's Stone, which is 
Harry. Harry. Right. So it's like, it's called the Philosopher's Stone. And there's a physical object in the book called the Philosopher's Stone. But Harry is the Philosopher's Stone. Yes. Like, it, it's so easy to just, like, the Philosopher's Stone ends up sort of just being like a, a, a MacGuffin by the end of the story. It's like, it doesn't come into play anymore, but it's like, that's because it's not really about the stone. It's because Harry himself is about the stone. Not only is he constantly represented by the color gold, like when they make the Polyjuice Potion for Harry later on, it turns gold. His wand shoots golden fire. He chases the golden snitch. Um... But the other half of it is that it gives you the elixir of life so that you can't die. And Harry literally comes back from the dead. Yeah. So and, it's like, and is in fact master. It's of like, death, it's yeah. like really, it's set up right from the beginning, especially if you know about the Ripley scroll that like he's attacked and then boom, right away, red, black, white are the first three people who physically touch him. Yes. And it's like, it's, that's crazy that it's set up so perfectly like that. Uh, and it's like, and, and it's just cool because like, this is like the, you know, Hagrid just mentions like, Oh, got enough young serious black. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's just some off-page character. Probably don't need to worry about him. It's right, like, right. Oh, wait yeah. a minute. <laughs> like, that, that, I think, is the number one detail when you reread the books again after you've read it the first time. You're like, <gasps> It's like, no. Because, I mean, that's that's the thing. Like, you know, now, now at this point in time, I suspect that if you're listening to this podcast, you two have, have combed through these books over and over and over again and and maybe have, have law. Like, you know every time you see it exactly what it means. But, like, when, when we were kids reading through this, for the very first time like Sirius Black didn't remain in the back of my mind for years and years years. so like when you hear his name again in Prisoner of Azkaban it's not like you're you're not like being like oh Oh, like the one with the motorbike like like, not at all you know you've long forgotten at that point it's been three years oh yeah since you've read those words that was the page I mean it'd be the same as trying to remember Daedalus Diggle who also gets a name drop here in the first chapter yes he sure does yeah we we eventually (laughs) go on to learn is in fact uh, you know of course a member of um, the Order of the Phoenix and will eventually be the one to escort the Dursleys uh, to to safety yeah so that's it's funny that he gets mentioned so early what's funny about that is that McGonagall thinks it's Daedalus Diggle who's doing the shooting stars down in Kent. He never had much sense or whatever. Oh, yeah, right, What I think right. is so funny about that is she's telling Dumbledore about this. And, like, McGonagall, surprisingly, was not a member of the First Order of the Phoenix. It is surprising. In, in yeah. the First Wizarding War, but she wasn't. Daedalus Diggle was. Right. So she's, like, sitting here, like, telling Dumbledore, like, oh, probably Daedalus Diggle. Meanwhile, Dumbledore's like, I'm the leader of a secret society fighting Voldemort, and that's one of my members. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you. Minerva, why weren't you in class today? Hmm. <laughs> Someone playing hooky? Someone playing hooky? Were they playing cat? Were they? There's also, man, there, McGonagall, I feel like, definitely goes through a big transformation. Um, the the more you get to know her, I do love that the very one of the very first things she does is, as a cat, gives Uncle Vernon a stern look. And it's like, classic McGonagall. Classic. Yeah. Classic McGonagall. Um, but then, like, it it is surprising to me as you go on that she's a little bit superior about um, being a wizard versus the muggles. Like at one point she's like, well, they're not completely stupid. (laughs) It's like, well, yeah, we know that. Certainly muggles aren't completely stupid. Yes, <laughs> right? yeah, like, yeah. No, this is this is like, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where um, it, it is very interesting just to see like the, the various differences between the, um, you know, like the, the magical philosophy versus the the non-magical philosophy. Uh, and, and of course, we will we will eventually come to learn again in the story that it's it's not like muggles are the ones exclusively known for um, maybe spoiling their their children. I mean, Dudley and eventually, you know, who will who will meet as as the character of Draco Malfoy are oh, are, yeah. are not terribly dissimilar, you know, in their in their upbringing and their their air of superiority over others. Yeah, for sure. So you know, I mean, that's that's like it's like McGonagall maybe needs to you know she she can maybe check it a little bit. <laughs> she can maybe check it a little bit. There's also like a funny uh, line here I thought where. Uh, when Dumbledore shows up and he's like, I should have known. Uh, and that's him looking up and seeing McGonagall sitting as a cat at Privet Drive all day. Right. And he's like, and she transforms and she says, how did you know it was me, Albus? And it's like, what, like, I, like, in, this is one of those things where it's like suffering from like pilot episode-itis or whatever. It, it is, it because is, Because it's like, yeah. like, in hindsight, like, there's, first of all, no way that Dumbledore doesn't know McGonagall is an animagus that can turn into a cat and doesn't know exactly what she looks like. And there's no way McGonagall doesn't know that Dumbledore knows what she looks like because this is her trick during the first class of literally every year. Like, even when 
Harry and Ron are unimpressed by it or whatever. Like she says, that's the first time my class has not been impressed by this, su- suggesting she does it every year. Yeah. And yeah, we yeah. learned that she's a registered animagus. So it's like, of course he knows she's a cat and knows exactly what she looks like. So like what, what, what this it's what, it's like a, that line does not age well. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't, but I, I think that the, the great, um, like forgiveness is exactly what you're saying. It's sort of like that pilot episode sort of like, like situation where it's like, you need to do some exposition along the way. You need to sort of like introduce the readers a little bit to what kinds of magic magic uh is, is possible what types of objects you might see like what these characters are like how they behave because i mean it's similarly you know we also have you know dumbledore of course pulling out the very famous uh you know putter outer or put outer the put outer yeah i do yeah. think it's funny that it's called the put outer here and later gets renamed to the way better deluminator deluminator yeah, yeah. It's, that and i mean we uh, same same exact thing you know we'll see in prisoner of azkaban is eventually the reference to the um you know the the guards of azkaban oh yeah um, versus dementors dementors yeah. you know it's like as as soon as they've been referred to as dementors once as soon as our characters have learned that name once it's like well from now on they're just dementors yeah, and like, like, just the but dementors. it's like why, why doesn't everybody re- refer to them as dementors up until this why why have they always been the azkaban guards and yeah and, and i i think like those are those are bits of forgiveness that i that I'll, i don't struggle with at all because it's sort of just like okay like we're we're kind of getting the wheels in motion here uh and, and oh, yeah. for the most part you know it's not like it's not like we never see mcgonagall as an animagus again it's it's just sort of like dumbledore absolutely knows dumbledore absolutely yeah. knows yeah i it, it is i think it's just funny the little things that like stand out like that like even even the fact that like as vernon's going to work that day there's people like already celebrating in the streets like voldemort's down hooray amazing and it's like like there's all these rumors immediately flying about the potters and how harry toppled him or whatever and it's like i the how could there be rumors already? <laughs> you know, that that part baffles me as well because like the Fidelius charm breaks and then Sirius is there and then Hagrid's there. And then that's like, you know, what, what would have happened that would have alerted everyone else and tuned them into the fact that it was Harry that stopped Voldemort like right away. Well, we've got, we've got the Sirius Black's attack on Peter Pettigrew. There is that. In, in a fairly public way. That happens in a fairly public way, but this is happening, like there's, the stuff's happening like as Vernon's driving to work. And like, I think that happens in broad daylight is what it said. This is a good point. Well, yeah. the, the other thing I think we can certainly have happening is like, you know, Godric's Hollow will eventually learn is, um, is a is a neighborhood so named for a Godric Gryffindor, of course, but um, is both a Muggle and Wizard occupied yeah. town, mm-hmm. and of course is where <gasps> the Potters lived. The Fidelius Charm is, of course, protecting their location. We know that the backfiring of Vada Kedavra spell is what will uh, break down the Fidelius Charm and and reveal the Potters' location to you know the outside world, which is then how you know Sirius is able to go and enter uh, the the fray and and find baby Harry still alive inside of the house, mm-hmm. uh, how Hagrid could also go and collect him. Cause gosh, is there anything sadder than a world where Harry backfires spells and then nobody can, can find him. Oh, I know. To, right. Yeah. The Fidelius charm. Like that's, that's horrifying to think about. Um, and, and so the only other thing I can imagine is, is like possibly once the Fidelius charm is broken, then people who had known that the Potters had lived there, who had forgotten per the Fidelius charm are now aware of their presence and the, the otherwise loud explosion and, and, oh, yeah, and, and sure. took to the streets, you know, cause yeah. um, you know, similarly, I mean, I, somehow Sirius black must've been informed. Some, somebody must've known to, to, to contact him well, as well. Right? I think he, no Sirius like went to, um, ch- he hadn't heard from Peter in a while and he went to go check on him and he saw that Peter had like abandoned his home or whatever. And as soon as he saw that, he was like, uh Oh, okay. And then gotcha. he went to go check on the potters and that's when he found Harry. And that's when he found Harry. Okay. Yeah. yeah so there you so, go. There you go. There's um, that. I suppose the other thing that's possible is that Voldemort, um, has a bunch of people under the imperious curse. And after he like falls, like they would all be released True. and they could maybe come to their senses about it. So that could, I guess, give away that Voldemort was gone. And then maybe could people, yeah, I guess people could start piecing it together. Like, oh my God, the Potters. Oh, th- we know where the Potters are. And people started being released from the curse. Right, right. And that's a curious one as well, where, where it'd be interesting if you've been under the Imperius curse for such a long period of time, it's possible the last, the last actual memory you have would be 
being placed under it. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and therefore, you know, you might be like, oh my gosh, like what is going on? What has, like, wh where have I been? What have I been doing this mm -hmm. whole time? So yeah, there, there are certainly some things that would happen that we'll learn about later in the story that, that could have unfold or been undone. Uh, and, and again, otherwise, you know, I think it's just sort of one of those, like, if you want to look at um, Petunia as the example. So she's somebody who, who stands there and as a muggle is effectively like, you know, doing the whole like grapevine sort of gossip over the hedge, you know, yeah. type of thing. And, and this is sort of like the wizards almost doing the exact same thing, which, which is just rumor flying right, like yeah. mad, all you over know, the place, and, yeah. and, and quickly, mm -hmm. uh, in such a big way. So, um, all, all very, very interesting. Another, another piece of it is the fact that, you know, McGonagall refers to the fact that it's been, um, 11 years, or I think Dumbledore says it's been 11 years since they've had anything to, to celebrate. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so of course, like everybody wants to, this is another one of those kind of like interesting things as we learn more about the overall narrative of the story and the, in the rough timeline like um i believe that tom riddle graduates from hogwarts in the early 1940s and we know that at that point in time he will eventually be you know hunting horcruxes and doing his whole thing to kind of become immortal right. and, and everything but 11 but years prior would be like 1970 Right. Yeah, eleven years prior would be nineteen seventy. So there, there has always been this kind of large and unusual <laughs> swath of time from I, I think the late nineteen fifties when we last see Tom Riddle doing anything um, up until like it's like there's like a fifteen year gap where where it's like he must have been like much more underground, like, like planning right. a lot, a more. lot of stuff. Um, because yeah. yeah, there's a huge gap of time. Cause like he unleashes the basilisk before he even graduates school. So that's when he makes the diary Horcrux. And then we know that immediately upon graduating, he pretty quickly acquires the diadem and the cup yep. as Horcruxes. And then he, oh, and the locket, sorry. The the yeah. locket, yeah, it's the, it's the locket in the in the cup, which he yeah. gets from um, Hepzibah. Hepzibah, Smith, Hepzibah Smith, of course, yeah. Hepzibah and then Smith. I guess maybe he talked to the great lady and early while he was at school and found the diadem yes. that way. Um, and then what else was he still missing? Then the ring he took from Morphin. Yep, right? the the ring he has before. Oh, yeah, yeah. graduating school because he's wearing school. it in Slughorns. So like possibly he's just spending the rest of the time looking for like the sword or or anything of Gryffindor's. You'd think. Right. Yeah. yeah. In, in our long theory for, for a very long period of time, this is, this is one of my all time favorites is that he, um, we, we eventually will learn as well that, uh, Molly Weasley, uh, her, her, um, surname originally was uh, before marriage was Pruitt. Yes. And she had two brothers, Fabian and Gideon, where, where you'll eventually get the F and G that become Fred, Fred and George. George. Um, and, and eventually I believe Harry receives for a 17th birthday from, um, uh, Mrs. Weasley, the, the signature gift of the golden watch from that was Fabian's. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we know that like we, we've got these members of the original order of the Phoenix. We know that Lily and James themselves, uh, as well as Neville's parents have thrice defied the dark Lord. So we know that, that they were attacking Gryffindor based, uh, wizards right. throughout this whole era of time. And, and it may be the case that Voldemort had learned the legend that the sword of Gryffindor will present itself to a Gryffindor in need. Right. And therefore like that, that was like, he's pummeling these, these wizards in the name of attempting to get the, the sword to appear to one of them, right. uh, which we can only assume he had successfully done and and basically was using this last final piece to to essentially immortalize himself, you know, by way of his seven Horcruxes, uh, and entering the the Potter's home, and was yeah. was intending to um, create his final Horcrux with the death of of the boy who was mentioned in the prophecy. Right, because like that's the other thing is Dumbledore eventually tells Harry he's positive Dumbledore that Voldemort was going to use Harry's death to make the final Horcrux. Yes, and it's, so it's like so. To that end, he must have had the, the the item with him when he went. And the clear thing he's missing is a relic of Gryffindors, yep. which, like, and you're right, the 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 Pruitts were killed by um, Death Eaters, yep. like, in a big struggle. And they would have been true Gryffindors who potentially the sword could have presented itself to. They could have recovered the sword, given it to Voldemort. There's also, like, this weird time gap where you know that Wormtail 
is the secret keeper and a mole. So like, there's no reason he almost shouldn't immediately tell Voldemort, but then they're clearly in hiding for more than like a day. So it's like, they're in the hiding for like months, right. you know? So it's like, why does he take so long to finally go and attack the Potters? And it's like, cause he doesn't have the sword yet yes. or something of Gryffindor. So yeah, it, it feels like there is, there is a lot lighting up for like Voldemort finally got the sword and was going to turn it into a Horcrux and then um, obviously, the entire plan failed, and then of course the reason the sword's not there is because one of the sword's tricks is that it disappears. Yes. <laughs> so, yep, yep. so there it is. Um, and then it's like we also know the sword does not have to appear via the sorting hat. Like that's how Neville and Harry get to it. But like Snape just puts it in the pond, and that's a totally acceptable way for it to have been presented to I guess Ron in that situation. Yeah. yeah. Th this is one of those big questions where where it's like the sentience of the sword itself is questionable because it it, it seems as though uh, from the moment that Harry takes it from the hat, you know, in in year two, it just resides in the in the headmaster's office up until the the time that Snape basically like leaves it yeah. leaves it for them. <laughs> in that instance, there there is the really fun. Fact, I and, and this is like I have no idea whether or not it was intentional, but it's glorious either way. But the fact that the sword presents itself through the sorting hat is is the like sorting hat. The, yeah. the <laughs> sorting hat. The sorting hat. The sorting hat. Yeah. Like it's like oh, like oh my gosh! And of course, the sorting hat uh, being the other viable option of an artifact of Godric Gryffindor's. Yeah. Um. That that could have been used. However, I I suspect the reason that the sorting hat wouldn't have been a great candidate for this final horcrux is uh due to the fact that it's it's like a uh, being missing would be um, might might invite seekers so yeah, to speak for you know sure. it's it's like a lot of these other artifacts yeah, are if you are, uncover the sword of gryffindor like no one's even gonna know exactly yeah, yeah right yes exactly because nobody nobody otherwise really you know similar to the diadem of ravenclaw it's like nobody really knows where it is so right. um but anyway i mean as as far as th those things are concerned i mean the Lost item of Ravenclaw has been gone for literal like like centuries, almost a millennium. Um, whereas you know the sword, like so, if anything, it seems like the diadem is still harder to get. I know. Um, so I I, lo I love the idea that that Voldemort was was walking into the Potters that that night. Although with the only thing, the only thing that I could imagine being so unbelievably cool, although it would change the entire story, is an unarmed Lily uh, being in the room, basically like like defending her son no matter what having an instance where the sword just like appears in her hand or something oh, and wow. then she's like lily standing there with the sword of gryffindor against voldemort would be i mean that, the, the epic scene crazy. in my head it's like it's like we could do an entire what if where what if the sword of gryffindor presented itself to <laughs> to lily, to, to lily yeah. in that she moment just slashes him down and right she just there. wins yeah that's right just right it there. no this, no other story yeah that's <laughs> it know. that's it end of game right there voldemort i guess it wouldn't have the basilisk venom yet so this is another one it's like the sword of gryffindor must have like other magical properties inside of it that like Harry and Hermione and Dumbledore never like activate or even aware of, you know, like, oh, true. is the Basilisk yeah. Venom the first time it ever absorbed something that made it stronger? Like, that doesn't seem right. No, it doesn't seem likely at all. Yeah. And, and so I, I suspect that if we ever learn more more history of that sort, we'll learn a lot more of what that thing had. Oh, I know. I so badly want there to be a founder series where you just get to see Gryffindor out there, like, wielding the sword and doing his thing. And, it, it would be so cool. You know, it would be so cool. Hamming so. it up with old Sal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the best of buds. The best of buds. Uh, I can just, I, you just imagine Helga and Rowena over there just rolling their eyes like they left again didn't they they're going okay Should did we he go bring help? the sword he bring the sword i'll get the cup <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, what does the cup do <laughs> what does the cup do <laughs> i know it turns water to wine we I think know. we know that much <laughs> that would be the fun part about the founders is that they like until like the very like last the end of the show the four of them are just best buds you know, like they're actual friends. Yes. And it's like, and, and I mean, obviously there's a big crack at the end and that's tragic or whatever, but for the majority of the show, they're all just chums. Right. Like you love their friendship. <laughs> like you yeah, love that. That has yeah. to be it. That has to be it. It does. It um, does. Someday, someday we'll get it. Someday, someday we'll be a founder series and that I can't wait. That's, that's the number one thing miss, that I want from Harry Potter. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, well, Jay, I think to, to kind of close out, uh, today's, today's episode, I think, um, you know, there, there's a couple of other like little tidbits that I would, that I would love to touch on. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I think, I think one of the big things, um, that I, that I, I reflected on a lot as I was reading, you know, this, this first chapter, especially like, you know, hard copy as, as we're saying, like, you know, kind of 
of going through and, and like feeling the pages, seeing the words on, you know, like, like in text and everything. I mean, it does, it does bring me back. And I was reminiscing a lot on, on kind of exactly what we said, you know, reading it, to, uh, our, our dad reading it to us when we were kids. Um, you know, I think the other big one is there's, there's this one line in particular that I think, uh, like hit me so hard because since, since, you know, reading these pages for the first time as a young kid, um, we, we, both now have our own kids, you know, mm-hmm. kids of our own. Uh, I've got my my daughter Addison, and you've got your your three boys. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Got my own troublesome twins, Nick and Nate, and then my eldest son Luke. Yep. Yeah. Um, but the the line the line that got me was the uh, one small hand closed on the letter beside him. Oh. Um, and and this is just like one of those things where it's like you know I I, I mean you know my like Addie's coming up on being two as of recording this, and you know it, it's like it is one of those things like you know where a lot of times I'll put her to bed and I'll pull her up on the monitor i'll see her like you know holding on to like her her like little um like kind of rectangle of fabric that yeah. she calls her oh no but um you know it's like that thought of, of like seeing this like small child clutching on to you know this this letter that's mm-hmm. going to be so impactful for the rest of its life uh, rest of his life you know it's just just very emotional you know it's like oh my gosh like the poor kid you know, he's, I mean, he's just, he's just uh-huh. lost he's everything. Just a and boy. He has no idea. Yeah. And, and he's about to be laughed <laughs> with just, just, just the worst people. And they're going to lie to him about what happened for the next 10 years. Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. just really, I mean, it's, it's like, I think my, you know, my heart goes out to, to baby Harry, uh, so hard. So that was just what I wrote in the margin next to that one was just tears. You know, oh. cause I think I was just, just very, very emotional moment. I know it changes when you get older. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. A big, a big perspective shift when you're, when you're now looking at it through the lens of, of parenthood. Um, and then, and of course the last one, you know, one of, one of my favorite things I think is, you know, the, the clever naming of, of the chapter is, is simply the boy who lived. Um, but, but ultimately there, there's a small, a small modification that, that you can make to that phrase that, that sort of sums up the whole series from, from the very beginning, which is, which is changing the word from lived to loved. And it's, it's Harry Potter, the boy who loved. Mm. And, and eventually what we will, what we'll see unfold with, with this character, with, you know, uh, with the story is that this is, this is really the defining characteristic that Harry is capable of that is secret that, weapon. Yes. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you, you see it be so difficult for Dumbledore to ingrain this message into, into Harry. And, and, you know, I think at some point in time, uh, like Harry says like, yeah, I can love, you know, yeah, yeah. big deal. I had to hold myself from saying, <coughs> yeah, big deal. Um, but, but it is just, it is really like a remarkable thing. And, and, and I've always loved that, you know, that it's like that, the, 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 you're literally one letter off from. Yeah. The like, boy who loved. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, and I, I almost feel like it would have made for a, fantastic final chapter name like if the story had started oh, it changed with the it boy, with the who, boy lived. who loved yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean you almost could have called the last chapter or the chapter where like i think it's called the forest or something the forest uh, again the forest again that one could have been called the boy who lived like also yes that's you know, true you could yeah. just done it again it would have been or that's what it could have been i guess you could have called king's cross the boy who lived or something i don't know you even could have just done the last the very last chapter could have it could have been bookended the whole thing that's true that would have yeah. been kind of funny king's cross is a pretty appropriate title name i think for that chapter but we're way off that one i know yeah we got a ways yeah. to go we got a ways to go so uh but anyway do, do you uh have any other closing thoughts how did you feel uh kind of coming through this this first chapter of our saga oh i mean i i, I loved it this chapter is so fun i mean it sets up so many things so well you get introduced to like so many big characters um i like there's other tiny little things i think are funny that like um at the end dumbledore um you know he apparates off the spot and the like mcgonagall turns back into a cat and slinks off and it's like wh- why why didn't you just apparate too <laughs> that was that, that doesn't make sense it's <laughs> like why did you? Right, so you go back to school yeah i know yeah, no, he says like, hey, i think he even says that he says i'll see you soon <laughs> Right, like, yeah. you mean tomorrow at class, right? Like, like, right, like, like literally immediately. Immediately, when we, when we arrive we're going to the same place, all right. three of us, because we all work there together. Right, right. Yeah, uh, I think that's pretty funny. Then Hagrid flies off on the motorbike, and it's like, what happened to the motorbike? You know, it's just gone for you know seven books, and then it shows up again. It shows back up. Yeah, it's the uh, thing that delivers them there. It's the thing that will eventually take them away from there. Yeah, I think that's funny. 
Um, let's that that see. is no mistake in my mind. I think eventually, when it comes to the uh, the the inevitable removal of Harry, you know, from from the Dursleys, the fact that he he entered and exited in on the, the same, motorbike, yeah, yeah that's, with the same person, with the same yeah. person, like that's on purpose. That's absolutely yeah. on purpose. That's a that's another great book. And I think there is a fun chapter. This like fast forwards the Chamber of Secrets a little bit. There's a chapter. There's a paragraph here where uh, Dumbledore is explaining why it's um, important that Harry grow away, grow up away from being famous he says it would be enough to turn any boy's head famous before he can walk and talk famous for something he won't even remember can't you see how much better off he'll be growing up far away from all that until he's ready to take it and it's like that paragraph right there explains exactly if you don't realize it is why Dumbledore hires Lockhart in Chamber of Secrets because this is what Harry could have been <laughs> yes <laughs> if yeah. he had like grown up maybe um somewhere besides the Dursleys doesn't mean the Dursleys was a great choice um it says he says it's the best place for him and it's like you really if you want to like unpack that sentence when he's saying the best place he doesn't mean it's the nicest place for him he means it's the literal safest place because Voldemort actually cannot get to him there yes yeah. absolutely and, and you know I think that this is again probably where Dumbledore because we we know um, eventually when, when Dumbledore does go and speak to the Dursleys again, uh, face to face, it, he, he does sort of mention that like, you know, when I left him on your doorstep all those years ago, I, I really hope that you would, you would like love him and treat him as your own son. And I see that you've clearly not done that. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think he, he makes a, a little remark about Dudley there. He's like, I can only be grateful that you haven't, you know, caused as much damage to Harry as you have to the boy sitting between you two. <laughs> I know, I know. They, all, they both look like. Someone here besides Dudley, I'm not seeing him. <laughs> you mean Dud Dudley's been treated Dudley's great? Been treated great. It's like, has he? Yeah. In your, uh, well. But but it, it's a good point though, and I think that there's a lot to to take away from from that because I actually highlighted that exact same um, uh, that same sentiment, and and I I didn't actually write down the lock card, but I, I I wrote down they did after all know James, um, and and I think that there's a piece of that like you know James is not for nothing, but a, like a, a a you know pretty cocky, arrogant kid i mean he he has his own kind of like bullying tendencies mm -hmm. like um you know there's there's certain characteristics about him that uh like you know it, it seems as though like like they always say like you know harry looks just like uh his his father except he got his mother's eyes and and it seems like also his mother's you know demeanor yeah along the way um, you know, which is, which is something to kind of see like interesting, be like a prevailing characteristic, you know, sort of through, through Harry, uh, despite maybe the, the Quidditch prowess, we will eventually see him also exhibit. Yeah, also has that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but we, we did do, uh, one of my, one of my more, uh, favorite things that we've ever written for, for our super Carlin brothers YouTube channel was, um, I think it was what if Harry, uh, what if, um, Sirius had raised Harry, Oh um, yes, you know, and instead, and or um, it was it was really what if Neville was the chosen one? That is exactly yeah. it. So what if Neville was the chosen one? In which case, um, what you would end up with is a, is a scenario where where Sirius is the one who raises uh, Harry, and it was one of my favorite uh, versions of Harry that we've that we've ever concocted because yeah. he he sort of has some of the the like jocular nature of James, but he, but he's also got like that prevailing kindness but but then also harry has like been raised by a very competent wizard for his right. whole life so, so it's he's like, kind of got like a little bit more, like way more skill and knowledge of the wizarding world he's sort of the ron to neville like in in that version neville has been basically successfully hidden by the Fidelius charm until he's going to Hogwarts. Yes. So he has been shielded from the wizarding world almost entirely in the same way Harry usually is, but his best friend ends up being Harry. So Harry's sort of the Ron to Neville's Harry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, except except you know, like like, but Harry's also got like the the skill. Yeah, but Harry's of, way yeah. more capable yeah. because it turns out when he's raised by Sirius, he's just teaching him all sorts of stuff and breaking the rules all the time. So it, it was a blast. It was yeah, a blast. that one's yeah, a really so. good version. So if you want to check that out, yeah, what if Neville was the chosen one? There you go. Um, I I mentioned that we would we would uh, address the chapter art. So I love the chapter art in the books. I feel like that like formed the first pictures of like what I thought the characters looked like when we were growing up. So what do you think, the boy who lived? chapter art chapter one it's just um harry sitting in a bundle of blankets underneath the stars i think it's beautiful yeah yeah i really love it you can see his little tiny scar there there is forehead. yeah you can yeah. see the little scar um it, i mean me. again you know because it goes back to that comment that i made but i mean it just makes me so mad it makes me so sad for for such a little uh you know like innocent child who who just basically like had had so much you know uh like kindness and, and promise and love all around him and 
to, you know, sort of be, be stripped of that. And, and, and I think like in this way, like when I look at this image, you know, it does, it does make me so much more aware. Like, of course, like as Harry will get older, he'll be surrounded by his, his like, you know, dear friends. And I mean, Ron and um, Hermione and, and the rest of the Weasleys and, and Ginny and the rest, I mean, they are his family, but like, it, it does make you realize when you think about it, just from this, like this little boy who had to grow up you know, for, for 10 years, uh, essentially completely isolated and, and, uh, mistreated by the people that he's with. And then the whole saga that he has to, to, to go on, you know, I mean, it, it does make you just feel like how, how alone he was in some ways. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that's, that's probably like expanding beyond the, uh, the, <laughs> the image of a little boy wrapped up in blankets here a little bit, but, um, I am glad to see that the stars are visible above him and it has not yet started raining. Well, other than that, um, I think the only other thing I had, um, written down here is like you mentioned, you, uh, was the one line that I felt like really stood out to me. It's like, you always talk about Harry Potter, the boy who lived and it's not like a really, um, you know, it's like, it's a common phrase, but I feel like when you end the first chapter, just the final line with people toasting to, uh, to Harry Potter, the boy who lived, like I was like, I get chills. Oh, I know. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. I mean, and it's, it's like the, um, the, the symbol that Harry, you know, kind of becomes to the wizarding world is, um, you know, I, I mean, in a lot of ways it's, it's the expectations that he'll, as an individual eventually face, which is like nobody can live up to the symbol that that has been created around him for, mm-hmm. for this defeat of someone who is, who has caused so much darkness in this world. And, you know, against all odds, somehow, some way Harry does, Yeah, you know, it's literally like, lives up. Yeah. Live, <laughs> like, live, lives up, dies a little bit and lives some more. Lives again. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know. It makes me so excited for, you know, the, the rest of the saga to come. I'm, I was really excited about just like, you know, one of the things that, 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 does blow my mind about this story is how much happens inside of one single chapter. Like I, I often think like you, you almost could have had, um, uh, like a prologue that, that tells you about the Dursleys a little bit and then have chapter one, the boy who lived in, and pretty much start with McGonagall and Dumbledore's exchange on, on Privet drive there. Just start with yeah, like Hagrid arriving or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Especially because it feels like that's that's sort of like when when the the part of the story you care the most about truly begins. It's like yeah, the, the magic. Yeah. yeah, it's like if anything, it's like can we get past the Dursleys just as soon as seemingly possible? I, know. I mean, I, I would like less time with them. I know. What's interesting to me is that you, that like there's not like there's not zero magic in here. There's no wand magic just yet. The, I think the very first magic you ever see in the whole series is the Deluminator doing its thing. Yeah. Other right. than, of course, McGonagall being right. transformed. Yeah, you see McGonagall as a transformed cat. But I guess when, you, I guess when you're when you introduced to it, you maybe don't know that yet. So okay, yeah. I guess, yep. yeah, either either you could count it as McGonagall or the Deluminator. And then, of course, she transforms. And then there's that. And there's the flying motorbike as well. Right, yeah. So yep. lots of stuff there. Lots of stuff there. Yep. Other little fun fact. I just discovered this today, actually. I did not know this. But um, Privet Drive, I always assumed was supposed to be a little bit of a play on the word private. Oh. Um, and I, I had not. I, maybe, maybe you knew this. I didn't. Uh, privet is a kind of hedge. Oh. And I think that they are typically hedges that are, in fact, That's used uh, like in suburban neighborhoods to kind of um, be barriers between your home and your neighbors. Oh. Um, so it, That's it, funny. It, it is, I did not realize. I also thought it was private drive. Yeah. Because they yep. like, like to be private. Oh, I, actually, on that note, so these are these are two things I misheard as a child. So I, I actually thought that it was private drive. I didn't like the word "privet" as a um, you know probably nine year old didn't register to me as meaning anything at all. The other was, of course, Dad was reading it to us, and I always heard uh, Albus Dumbledore's name as Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in my mind, I literally always assumed that I, I for some reason, I, I very quickly embodied um, uh, Dumbledore with it with a sort of like like very musical Very musical <laughs> like rock king of rock and roll you know? yeah, yeah yeah kind of vibe so um i i think i even remember getting like like i think i was talking to you actually and it's probably would have been one of those those first moments where our our age difference or your just better memory than mine uh came up but but i remember saying like like well like didn't elvis say something and you're like elvis and it was like <laughs> the headmaster and you were like it's albus, albus. and i was like 
it is not. Where's the book? Yeah. And it was like, we went and picked it up and I was like, it's like literally, it's like one of those moments where I was like, someone changed someone it. Someone changed it, man. Certainly. Mandala effect or whatever. Yeah. This is a, uh, another little tiny thing like that. This is just a funny change from like um, the, the UK version of the book to the American one. It is the first word Dudley or the new word that Dudley learned that day. In the American version, it's won't. But if you go to the UK version, it's shan't. Oh, that's awesome. Shan't. Shan't do it. Shan't. Shan't. Amazing. I love the idea of a little baby just be like, shan't. Shan't. <laughs> it's especially funny because I always think that, um, like, you know, like in, in all the, the various languages across the world and stuff like that, very, very frequently, not always, you know, it seems like the word for, for like, you know, we say mom and dad, but like, or some variation of, of something similar to like mama, papa, like yeah. those, those types of words. Um, and I, I sometimes like wonder whether or not like it's, it's small children's uh, early development of speech that actually is the like, uh, like etymology behind those words oh, probably which which you know in the in the event you know i've heard my own daughter say won't before or 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 no yeah <laughs> um but you know it, it makes me wonder if if the word shant is actually created um in in part by uh by by toddler speak you know oh, yeah. uh, you know it's could it's, be yeah right you know, <laughs> a word a word created by youngins that that the rest of us continue to use the rest of our lives so that's funny i did not realize that that was different in in the different narratives uh in in speaking of dudley uh looking forward to chapter two uh which will be our next episode the vanishing glass Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Ben Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone Chapter 2, The Vanishing Glass. Wow. Top tier intro. Today. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that you. Was, that was really good. I feel yeah. like I feel like you you have just been held back as is nearly as all as I can tell. I mean, yeah. we've, we I have, see you're repping the shirt from our other podcast where for some <laughs> somehow I guess everyone thinks you're a better host over there. Oh, I don't know anything about that. But what I do know about is chapter two of the of of the Philosopher's Stone, aka Sorcerer's Stone, aka. The Vanishing Glass. Where, so, do, where do you land on Philosopher's Stone versus Sorcerer's Stone? I will tell you that I went through a myriad of different uh, emotions attached to this particular thing. So obviously, right. um, as an American and the first copy of the of the book that I ever owned as a kid was Sorcerer's Stone. And one of my best friends at the time, um, for one reason or another, um, his, his family was extremely into like Premier League soccer and sort of like all things like England. And uh, I know that he had had a copy um, of the Philosopher's Stone, I believe before it had been released as the Sorcerer's Stone in America. Wow, so he and, probably has a pretty rare copy. <laughs> well, this was like one of those things. It was like a childhood friend who I had not known uh, or had not spoken to, I, I think pretty much at all, just because we like moved in different directions in life starting from like age, maybe like 10 or 11. Yeah. Um, but like as we were like best friends starting from like day one of preschool and stuff like that. And once upon a time, we made... Uh, a video over on the Super Carlin Brothers channel talking about like the most valuable copies of the Harry Potter books. And um, like what you're ultimately looking for is the first run. Um, what is it? The ISBN number? Uh, yeah, like the, it's on like the on the in yeah the inner in inner cover there. I'd have to go back and look at all the specific ways in which you tell which run and which edition uh, a book is. But you want first run, first edition UK. Yes, exactly. And and I as we were like making that video and sort of like reviewing what those ISBN numbers were, I was like, goodness gracious! Like this childhood friend very well might have like a very valuable copy of the book. And so like on a whim, I had like gone off to Facebook. I don't even know if we were friends on Facebook. And so like I found him, added him and like immediately sent him a message. And I was like, Hey, wild story, but like yeah. we're, we're making this video. Uh, and I remember you had this book. And so I was like, is there any chance you know where it is? Could you like check the, the, the number and like within 17 minutes of sending him 
that message, he had sent me a picture back of his numbers. Whoa. And I was like, I can't believe you had, like, not only did you go from accepting my friend request, reading my message, and then found the book, sent a picture of it and returned it to me. Um, so it, it wasn't like a first edition, a first ah, edition. But, bummer. But it was like one of those points of contention, I think, because he he read the UK edition. Um, and so, so he had a shant book. He had a shant book, yeah. yeah and, and he referred <laughs> to it as the Philosopher's Stone. And it was it was always one of those things very early on where it was like, okay, it's Sorcerer's Stone. All right. Like, you okay, know, all like, right. So I think I had a chip on my shoulder for a really long time. And then uh, we mentioned in the last episode about how we went to uh, the British Library, the History of Magic exhibit, and, and sort of like delved really further deep into the history of, of the true blue, like, uh, philosopher stone yeah. th- throughout actual, you know, human history. Um, and I think from that point on, I was always like philosopher. Stone. Okay. Philosopher so, stones yeah. like the real, like there's, there is like in history, there was a philosopher stone. People actually tried to make the sorcerer stone is a complete fabrication. It means nothing. It, it means nothing. And, yeah. and largely <laughs> what it comes down to is like, I, I, I believe that the publishers thought that American, um, like buyers might be more open to the term sorcerer than philosopher. Like yeah. it, it seemed more magical to, I, I guess, or whether they, they, the perception at least was that the case. That was the yeah. case. Um, I, I teeter back and forth though, because I, I never want to like, you know, gatekeep anybody or anything like that. You know, if you love the story, you love the story. That's all that matters. Right. Um, I, I think I have started to adopt philosopher stone as my, as my primary. Parent. I think so. Yeah. I remember growing up. Yeah. We just had sorcerer stone. And when I heard that, it, like, you know, if, I think in history, the philosopher shown will be remembered as a thing from Harry Potter more than it will be thing, something remembered as like a real thing people tried to make. Yeah, like it's, which is silly. But yeah. in the in the field of alchemy, the philosopher's stone essentially is the end all be all. It's like, like the point of alchemy. It is the point of alchemy yeah. is to achieve the the philosopher's stone. So, yeah. um, so there is that. So I think yeah. G- similarly, growing up though, I I'd never heard of it at all, and so it was like philosopher's stone, sorcerer's stone. Obviously, sorcerer's stone is better. And then um, we had like another we have another friend in Europe who's like a um, uh, he used to do a a lot of Harry Potter videos his name is Seamus and um, he you know he came to visit us one time so then it was very fun to be like oh no the American version's better oh yeah of course of course yeah Uh, but then same thing we went to that British library thing it was like oh it's absolutely philosopher's stone like since then that's been like my this is the correct version but this is my recent update as of the last month I would I personally am still a philosopher's stone and I think when I adopted that I was like this is clearly the correct way to say it. Like this is absolutely the right answer and everyone knows it. I've been ignorant this whole time. And so that's what I've been saying since then. But um, we just did a video where we reviewed the covers of a bunch of different copies of Philosopher Stone. Yes. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, this yeah. is crazy. And so the, I mean, because if you don't know, whatever copy of Harry Potter you have, there are especially for Philosopher Stone, there are the most versions of that cover, but there's like over a hundred different official covers that um, you could have and they uh, they range from like wild and wacky to like awe inspiring and amazing. So if you want to check us out like we go through I think we've ranked over like 90 of them at this point. Yeah, or yeah. not ranked but rated them or just reviewed them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sort of like gave our two cents on, on yeah. how we felt about it. Yeah, but so anyway when we posted that video I had to decide what I was going to call it and it was a very obviously like re- you know um, reacting to 50 different philosopher stone covers and I, you know I put philosopher stone in the title and I put philosopher stone in the thumbnail and I I was like, okay, didn't even think twice about it. But then I, uh, and it, you know, as you go across all the other countries, America is the only one that listed a sorcerer stone. All the other countries listed as a version, like their language's version of philosopher stone. Right. Yes. So it even made sense in that regard. But I was like, you know what? Let me do like just a little. I'm going to run like a little A B test here and see whether or not the click through rate is higher if we change it to sorcerer stone versus philosopher stone. And like it. T- totally was it was way more was effective w- not yeah. just a little like way more effective and it was like oh this is hilarious like our, our viewing audience is clearly in america and uh they they recognize F- sorcerer stone as the true title of <laughs> Harry Potter. apparently yeah number so one th- that's that's so. our that's our statistic based reason uh yeah. for for why you may call it sorcerer stone yeah but. so why if you see it listed that way but anyway i think even though the the copy we're reading says sorcerer stone on the on the front and i have to say i'll do you a quick um cover artwork rating this one's awesome it is like a pencil drawing it's got harry there's a big snake there's hedwig there's goblins there's hagrid and the egg there is mcgonagall back there lots of little eager oh there's even quirrell i just found him for the first time that's crazy oh wow yeah i hadn't even spotted him either kind of like yeah, right underneath there. oh there's chin. maybe even voldemort 
right over Hedwig's head. This is a really cool um, copy, and I think there's a whole series yeah, on the inside cover there. So very cool one. Anyway, Ben, let's jump into chapter two, The Vanishing Glass, where we are celebrating uh, Dudley Dursley's first birthday. It's, it starts out. This is this is actually I'm going to start out right away at the really cool fun fact. Okay. Yeah, lay it on. Okay. Us. So the first uh, three words is just nearly 10 years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on their front step. Okay. The, the, the phrase nearly 10 years immediately like reminded me of this amazing fact that you that that is true. Just true about Harry Potter. So um, Harry's parents are attacked on October 1st. 1980 or October 31st, 1981. Correct. Right. Yes. Meaning that we are now uh, as of this chapter in June, I believe of it is 1991, right? So yeah, 1991. So it has been nearly 10 years. So Harry's birthday is on July 31st of 1991, uh, which would be uh, and um, that is not just nine years later, but is also nine months later from the attack on his parents down to the day because it's October 31st and July 31st. Yes, meaning that it is exactly nine and three quarters years from the moment Harry leaves the wizarding world to re enters it. It's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. So yeah, the, the nearly 10 years is such like a little like tip of the hat. It's like nearly. Yeah. yeah, but then it's so great because it's platform nine and three quarters, which literally takes him to the wizarding world. It's yes. just like I love it. It's so, I like I don't know if that was accounted for or on purpose. It feels like no, because it's just like because Halloween feels like a specific date and July 31st is the author's birthday as well. Yes, so yes. it's like that. Yeah. Those don't feel, it just feels like it worked out perfectly. I know. Yeah, yeah, just just but it, I mean, it's amazing that it literally is coming down to actually actually the day itself. Yeah, um, but I guess technically at this point in time that that is upon uh, that is really the distance of time since um, Hagrid himself has last yes, seen. It is. It Harry. is the exact amount of time from Hagrid to yes. Hagrid in Harry's life, um, but it's so fun. Uh, I think that we're but that's that's a chapter ahead. That's a we're chapter getting ahead, ahead of yeah. ourselves here. This is the vanishing glass. It's Dudley's birthday right now, June 23rd. Yes, yes, indeed. And um, this this chapter, I think, is really it's kind of all about, I think, giving you a really strong sense of just how difficult this decade has been yeah. for for Harry. Like you're getting a really good feel. I mean, right away you learned that, like you know, he sleeps in the cupboard underneath the stairs in that mm -hmm. cupboard in a house that is otherwise described as like almost verging on like uh, like upsetting levels of immaculately clean. <laughs> it is, is weird how that's described. It's like it is almost upsettingly clean in the house. Yes, yeah. I, I often think that this is like one of those things where it's like it's like because I mean I tend to feel like I keep my house pretty clean as well, and I'm always like. Sometimes it's almost like you know, like you're scrubbing your counters or something, and you're like, "Should I lay off a little bit? Am I, am I, am I taking this too far? Am I, have, <laughs> like, I, have I reached Petunia Dursley levels of cleanliness? I don't think I'm it's never concerned about that in my house. No, I mean, I, no, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, of course no, not. Let me, me tell you what, my three boys, they I could clean it, and they'll they'll come through, and ten minutes later, it's like, why did I even bother? It's right. just anyway. Yeah, but but either way, so just despite this immaculately clean house, uh, Harry sleeps in a cupboard underneath the stairs that is apparently absolutely just jam packed full of spiders. Yeah, the amount of times the spiders in, in the cupboard under the stairs are brought up is like it's like, how could there be that many spiders if the the rest of the house is so clean? It's I, like, I know. Are they just drawn to him? Is that like a magical thing? <laughs> well, and this is what I find to be kind of interesting about this chapter in particular is that you both learn about Harry's relationship with spiders and his relationship with snakes. And it seems yeah. like his relationship with snakes goes on to be massively important to his overall character altogether. Yeah. Uh, and his relationship with spiders is is not nothing, but it's like, it's. I, I do think it's interesting that like, it's a semi prominent thing that he will interact with in his years to come, yeah. but, but not really important in any other way. I mean, it, it isn't, I mean, it's fairly, I guess it's like, was this, a, was there a certain amount of consideration given to like, I re like really establishing Harry as like, I'm not afraid of spiders. Like, like because 
later on, we're going to have to go over to the forest and follow giant spiders. And like even a regular person who's not like afraid of spiders still might not want to like follow spiders. I, I suppose, you know? I suppose there's some possibility there. I think the other thing is, I mean, I, I don't know if like on some level, just Harry, um, you know, like he, he is a true blue Gryffindor at the end of the day, his, you know, his bravery is, you know, rather immense. Like in spiders are a rather common thing for someone just to be fearful of in right. general. So that's it, true. It, it it's just like establishes be, some Gryffindoriness. This is, yeah, it's a, like I got to the end of this chapter. I was like, man, this is like a not a whole lot happens in this chapter. Like there's not a lot of magic happening. Well, some magic happens, but there's no like there's no there's no other wizarding people at all. It's just Harry. Well, this is I mean, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like a like a season of um, like network TV shows where very frequently what you would find is that like like episode one would be jam packed with like sort of like get you like back mm -hmm. into the action or, or introduce you to like a story and like, like all the juicy details. And then sort of there's like a taper off as the season like progresses because usually network TV shows would go for like a 20 plus episode season. Yeah. And that's a lot of time to cover. It's a lot of screen time. So like you almost need to have these like otherwise side plots and stuff. And so th this story is maybe no exception to that in some capacity where like on some level you're just introduced to like Dumbledore and Hagrid and McGonagall and like the fall of Voldemort and like, you know, like all <laughs> of this massive monumental stuff is happening. And then and then this chapter is a bit more like like cooking like, bacon and going to the zoo. Right. Like, it's like, let's reset. Like we knew a lot of the stuff. Let's meet Harry, the 11 year old as he is now before anything crazy has happened to him. Yes. What has happened in the last 10 years? Like we're going to bridge a gap here. So that that's a lot of what's happening here. I would say on the first page, a couple or on the second page here, a couple of things popped out to me. Like, first of all, I love that he had a dream about the flying motorcycle in it. It's just like, oh, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, it's a little heartwarming it's, there. It's a little heartwarming. And it's also like I think that that's a good setup for for things to come because Harry's dreams are not irrelevant to the story going <laughs> forward. Like you learn yeah. a lot about the wizarding world. The, the story progresses oftentimes thanks to Harry's dreams. And so this is this is kind of like a cool one where um, where where it is. It's a little bit more positive than a lot of the dreams that Harry gets to have going forward, which yeah. tend to get a little bit darker. Yeah. And then just write like a paragraph later. This is just something I noticed that this, we talked about last time. It's like some things are a little different once you're older, like you just might read past it or something. But um, like just when you realize like through the scope of time, how close Dudley's birthday is to Harry's like I think Dudley's is June 23rd and his is July 31st and they're born in the same year. Yeah. So yep, they're born age. like within a month of each other. Right. Basically, which is just like when I think about it, it's just like super duper sad for Lily and Petunia because like they would have been pregnant at the same time and it's, basically just not spoken to each other at, at all. all. Yeah. And it's just like it makes you think like because the the Dursley said they never met um, they never met Harry, which probably means that Lily and James died without ever having met their nephew, oh which my is gosh, like also yeah. sad. That is super you know? sad. Yeah, yeah. I, I never really I never considered it through their lens looking the other way before. Yeah. And, and of course that is, I mean, you know, one of the grand sacrifices that I think James and Lily would have made at some point in time was, was living under the Fidelius charm lent, meant being stuck inside of your home, mm -hmm. you know, just w with nobody to accompany you except for your, your immediate surroundings. I mean, and for people who are so used to, um, you know, sort of like adventure and being in the fray and, and being so involved as like, you know, sort of warriors in this cause, it's like, I mean, you could, you could just imagine the level of, of kind of like stir crazy that would, that would be involved. And, and then not to mention everything else you miss out on in the meantime. Yeah. Um, and it's like, I like to think in my head that like eventually they would have tried to like reconcile with the Dursleys. Oh, like sure. if you know, there's no war or whatever, like eventually they like try or at least get Harry to meet his cousin or something, but it's like that never gets to happen. I know. I know. And, and I do think, um, and, and I'm, I, it's, it's always possible. I mean, I, I know that we've consumed it a million different ways. I know that there's a deleted scene in the films when the, the Dursleys are ultimately leaving where mm -hmm. she, where Petunia has a moment with Harry and I'm pretty sure it doesn't happen in the books. It might just be a movie only moment. I think so. Um, but it's something that I actually felt like the movies, even though they cut it out, there was a deleted scene. scene. Uh, it, it was one of those rare occasions where I actually felt like they added something to the story that was really uh, kind of nice, which is which is Petunia basically saying like, you know, you're not the only one who lost somebody that day uh, and essentially alluding to the, the reality of the fact that, you know, like despite the fact that they've had a fraught relationship, Petunia lost her sister mm -hmm. um, who, you know, even if she had struggles and, and her insecurities and stuff that sort of like lead Petunia down the path that we ultimately know she goes down. It's, it's not as though she didn't still love her sister underneath it all. 
And yeah, that's, that, that's, that's hard yeah. and complicated I to think, unpack. I think the closest you get to that in the books is just like Dumbledore sending that letter that says like, remember my last or something. And she's like, go oh, PS to stay. Even yeah, though, that's like, true. Yeah. yeah. And it's like yeah. that, but that's as close as you get in the book. So yeah, they cut that out of the movie. And then they also cut out the scene where Dudley tells Harry he's not a waste of space. Oh yeah. Which but, like but also they, it does happen in the book and you can watch the deleted scene and it's awesome. <laughs> like, it, yeah, I know. It's yeah. a great moment. It's, it's like, like, why yeah. didn't you leave this in? This was great. I know. I, I have, I have the, this feeling in such a big way about a lot of the characters we, and, and I'm sure we'll get to Draco a lot as well, but oh, like, yeah. you know, the, with, with Dudley in particular, it's, it's one of those things that were especially as I've gotten older as a kid, you know, I knew kids like Dudley and I, and I, I mean, it was frustrating and, and you didn't want Dudley to win and, and all the rest. And, uh, as you get older and you reflect a little bit on, on, you know, like sometimes as a kid, what are you supposed to do other than parrot your parents' beliefs? You know, it's like as an 11 year old, it's like, you're not, you haven't really been given enough freedom in life to think independently from everything you've ever, you've ever seen or, or, you know, like experienced, right. which is your, your upbringing and, and views and perspectives of your parents. And, uh, interestingly, like one of the things that, that I'm going into the, the next page here that I had written down was like, you know, the, the Dursleys go to such extreme lengths to spoil Dudley that at times I've been curious before, like had Harry not been in the home, like would they have spoiled him to this extent because it's so aggressive. Oh, it's so over the top. I don't think so. Cause there are, there are like several examples, even just in these first few, first few chapters where it's like, they're going like out of their way, like putting extra effort on themselves to like make sure Harry is miserable. Yes. Like even the spiders, it's like the whole house is clean. The like clearly you care about it, but there's still spiders under the stairs. Yeah. Like, yeah. So it, yeah. Sometimes I think like what they're really doing is not spoiling Dudley so much as trying to demonstrate their, their active neglect of Harry. Right. Like, like, yeah, look, we, we bought Harry or we bought Dudley, you know, when it's he gets to the zoo, an active, it's almost an oxymoron active neglect. Cause it's like, it, be better if you just just neglected him. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, what, what that being said, one thing I have read about the Dursleys before is, is almost this idea that they, that, and, and this is the, the barest minimum. And, and, and I would barely even call it like an accolade, but, but they do not pretend to love Harry. Um, so like, I don't think that, and maybe, maybe this is uh, again, I mean, it's, it's hard to call it a gift, but like, maybe this is like one of those things where it's like, Harry doesn't have the wrong idea about what, what love looks like. He's just never experienced it prior, right. you know, w throughout his entire lifetime with the yeah. Dursley. So, uh, at least on some level, he's not led to believe like, like Rapunzel under mother Gothel's care, you know, and entangled or something. Oh, like, right. She thinks this is what love looks like. And it's like, that's just gaslighting. That's just nope. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, uh, not to, not to get too off brand here, but, um, Anyway, yeah, so the rest of this chapter has uh, really like the entire journey um, to the zoo, uh, a lot of sort of demonstrating how how spoiled uh, Dudley is. We, of course, have the whole like, you know, how many how many are there? 36 count them myself. <laughs> yes. Um, and and I, that's always been one of like the most quotable lines in my mind from the movies that that has just simply ever existed. Um, we have the very, very, very brief uh, introduction to uh, Pierce Polkis, who we spoke a little bit about uh, in last week's episode, but who, um, at one point in time, you actually wrote a, a rap about, mm -hmm. um, I sure did, which was, which was truly incredible, but basically it suggests that, uh, Peter Pettigrew had himself a son, uh, with, with sort of that like shared initial scheme with the, the Pierce Polkis, the Pierce Peter, Polkis Pettigrew. Peter Pettigrew. It's and not just that it's that also he said he has a face like a rat. Yes. <laughs> it's like in it's the like, same sentence. And it's like, well, 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 well face like a rat. Come on with the same, the same initial scheme right there. Pierce Polkis is also the one who's like, Harry was talking to the snake. Like he's the one it's like, that's, it's like a really subtle thing, but it's like in Pierce's mind, it is possible to talk to snakes. Oh, sure. You know? Yeah. It yep. is like, 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 whereas like the, the rest of the muggles you meet, it's like, they would, you, you just sort of know, like you can't talk to snakes, but in Pierre's mind, like maybe there's just enough like magic in there that it's like he, he can see, he thinks of talking to snakes as a thing that could happen. Yes. Like maybe he's a, probably a squib is really more what it is, but very possible. But yeah, yeah the, the other aspect of it there as well is um like, he's playing a kind of similar role with Dudley where, where he does come across as like, you know, Dudley's sort of like the, like the big, the big mean bully that I feel like everybody mm -hmm. sort of has to like bend to and uh, Peter Pettigrew's primary operative for, for pretty much everything, even his attraction to the Marauders in the first place has to do with, with essentially looking for, for the, the biggest kid on the yard. Um, and then obviously once, 
once Voldemort becomes the even bigger kid on the yard, he, he's just always a kind of a coward seeking the safety of, of that protection. Yeah. Um, and in a way that seems like that's exactly what Pierce is. So exactly. It's exactly I, like that. So yeah, I, I, I stand by it. Pierce, Pierce Polkus is the, um, uh, is the, uh, bastard child of Peter Pettigrew. There you go. Yep. There you yep go. Indeed. Um, so there's a few things here, like as we're just introduced to Harry, the 11 year old and like what his relationship with the Dudley is that I just like, I, I marked and I thought were very like fun and interesting things that popped out, uh, as per the overall story. Um, first is that uh, it talks about how Dudley's favorite punching bag is Harry, but he can't often catch him because Harry didn't look up, but he's very fast. And it's like, it's like just sort of immediately setting you up for like Harry the seeker later yeah, on. Absolutely. Yep. And, and also uh, in a way, Dudley the boxer. Uh, Dudley the boxer, become, big yeah, D. <laughs> big, big D. Yeah. So I do find it to be kind of interesting and funny that like, almost right away this idea of of punching is sort of like ingrained into who Dudley is so I mean right. he, he did show some some early signs yeah there's yeah. no doubt there's no doubt about it um, then uh, Harry is immediately described as having the bright green eyes which of course is uh, one a nod to his mother he's always described as looking like his dad but then having his mother's eyes but then it's also really funny that like um, there's like this weird contrast where Voldemort ends up having red eyes and Harry has green eyes and they're like the opposite colors of the houses they're in. Yes. And, yeah. and additionally as well, the, the Avada Kedavra curse is green, is whereas green. Expelliarmus yeah. is red. So or, yeah, or at least in the movies, at, yeah. at least in the movies. I think, yeah. I think it's described as red sparks, but I, can't, oh, I guess I can't, I can't Maybe remember specifically, but Avada Kedavra is always green. Avada, yeah, definitely yeah. green. So it, the, the um, kind of um, yin and yang effect that appears to be going on. Yeah. Like sort of like with that red and green, you know, sort of speaks to the duality actually. And I could even set us up for one of the, the kind of fun theories you could examine um, that, I, that I don't necessarily think you would subscribe to actually, but um, is the, the general sentiment that um, in some way, because Harry has a piece of Voldemort's soul inside of him, that he is in fact a Horcrux and therefore the mistreatment of him at the hand of the Dursleys is much more a la Ron wearing Slytherin's locket in, you know, Deathly Hallows mm -hmm. and like the presence, but this is, it, it it's kind of one of those where it's like the Dursleys make it pretty clear pretty early before Harry's even there that this is not their their kind of yeah. people. They are not for it. We also know that Petunia has a very strong history with her sister. Like her own sense of insecurity is what's driving a lot of her hatred towards Harry. Yeah. Um, and it's also a, it's, it's kind of like one of those theories where like when you first hear it, you're like, oh, that's interesting. And then it's also like kind of feels like uh like your your victim blaming it yeah, like did as well like, like making excuses for the Dursleys and it's like nah yeah, you don't need to make excuses yeah, for the Dursleys. You don't need to make excuses there. for the Dursleys right, right there. Um I also they also talk about how like they keep cutting Harry's hair cuz it's always like so messy, but it makes no difference his hair always grows back yep. and it like it always grows that way and I think that's really funny. It's like that his hair doesn't just always grow back, it always grows back messy. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's like yep. which is like it there's a certain like um like th like like overall, as you continue to experience more and more of the wizarding world, there's this like underlying messaging that like you know a little bit of rule breaking. Like magic is just sort of like messy by nature. Like if you're really into magic and you're doing magic right, it's like a little bit messy and it's a little rule breaky and it's a little like not perfect and ordered. It's a little jumbled and yeah, stuff. And right. I'm like I think like it's like yeah, the magic could just fix Harry's hair, but it's like it is not just out of place. It's like magically out of place. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's funny too, because I mean, you eventually do learn that like a, a huge reason why Harry has such an inheritance uh, from his family has has something that stems directly back to his uh, like genetic predisposition to have this particularly messy hair. Yes, as one, of his, right. the one of his easy hair. Yeah, potion. the sleek easy hair potion yeah. is it's, it's a little bit of uh, additional reading outside of the universe, but you do eventually learn that uh, the the inventor of that is one of Harry's forefathers yeah, and that that's is why where, he's so rich. That's where the family wealth comes from. And so. yet Harry does not ever apparently use the potion. He doesn't seem to whatsoever. No. Yeah, it has, has no no, no knowledge whatsoever. This is something you yeah. have a relationship with. Um, um, yeah. This is okay. The, also, Harry describes Dudley as looking like a pig in a wig, which I just think is funny because Ron eventually goes on to own an owl named Pigwidgeon, which is like pig wig, pigwidgeon, pig in a wig. And it's like, did did Harry give Pigwidgeon the name? Is this like a is this like a very subtle like Loki stab at Dudley for like years later, <laughs> <laughs> where like he's comparing giant Dudley to the tiny like tennis ball owl that is Pigwidgeon? Because yeah. Harry also uses wig in his own owl's name. <laughs> That's true. It's That's like true. Pigwidgeon, Hedwig, 
pig in a wig. I don't know. Maybe there's something there. <laughs> no, yeah, I got you. I mean, it seems like Pigwidgeon and Dudley are about as far apart from one another as they possibly oh, could. Be. Absolutely, they are. <laughs> uh, but but I do I do kind of I never noticed the the fact that there's wig in both Hedwig and Pigwidgeon's name before. That's yeah. pretty funny. Uh, one of the other details that that I highlighted in this particular chapter is the fact that we get the introduction to the infamous or famous just in that in that sense uh, round glasses that Harry wears. Oh yeah. Uh, this is always one of those things. So we of course know that. Um, Harry is, is pretty aggressively mistreated by the Dursleys, but there, there is always one of those like, like, um, like at some point in time, they had to take him to the eye doctor, right? You know, and, and almost and certainly, they did. <laughs> yeah, and they did. And, and so like, I've even thought before, like, you know, as, as time has gone on, um, you know, like probably even had to go more than than once like even after harry started like attending hogwarts it feels like at some point over the summer he probably needed to like go back and have his eyes checked again like surely he from age 11 till 17 he's not wearing the same pair of glasses oh right, right. like he probably needs a bigger pair at some point at some point at some, yeah yeah you're right <laughs> do you think he's doing it over the summer right yeah, yeah. it's like maybe it's like he goes back to the, he has to go back to the dursleys for you know of course the, the the ancient magic protection that keeps him safe there and new glasses yeah and to visit the actual muggle eye doctor yeah yeah for sure that's in there as well um let's see we get introduced sort of to aunt marge here like she's referenced in the last one and this time she's given a name yep. as someone who gave it dudley uh, it's it's crazy how quickly she's introduced and like it, it, she just feels like an off page character and then she actually shows up in prisoner of Azkaban to be the worst. Yes, she she is. I mean, I think Aunt Marge is right up there with, um, you know, eventually Dolores Umbridge yeah, in, yeah. in that very like, comparable just just like a truly terrible person. But like we, we've said this on so many occasions before, but like, you know, Voldemort is evil in this sort of like storybook evil sense, you know, but then yeah. like like Umbridge is a teacher you've just had before. Yeah. Aunt Marge is just a, a, a disapproving relative you've had like right. these are just mean like like this is not like an otherworldly it's not a magical kind of evil this is like a down to earth real like kind of person you might just encounter or yeah. or yeah like almost inevitably um so yeah that it's it, it is interesting again because you know we get serious black in chapter one aunt marge in, in uh chapter two and both of those characters are are very prominent in the beginning of prisoner of azkaban yeah you know, two books ahead let's see yeah um we also get mrs fig Yes, uh, introduced here, and it's this is interesting. It says bad news, Vernon. She said Mrs. Figs broken her leg, and it's like, um, and then there's later down in the paragraph it says, now what? Said Opportunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. <laughs> and I'm always like, like this is one of those like. Now, obviously, Harry didn't do anything to Mrs. Fig, but we know that Mrs. Fig is a member of the Order of the Phoenix and a squib who lives across the street, and it's like. Did Dumbledore plan this? Like, yeah, did, did, did Dumbledore <laughs> want this to happen? Because it this is like one of those like Dumbledore's big plan. Like he's Dumbledore knows about the prophecy like since before the attack on the Potters. Yeah, and like he already knows Harry's going to have to be the one. So it's like he he begins pulling the strings on Harry's life like way earlier than you might realize. And it's like did Dumbledore like like want Harry to go to the zoo because he knew that Harry would then see a snake and like was, did he have some idea like is there is there any of that happening here the, like, there's maybe yeah. <laughs> I mean uh, book, book one in particular has a lot of signs that suggest that that what Dumbledore is truly doing the whole time is is trying to guide Harry and give him the necessary ingredients and and even you know Harry will eventually say in, in like you know towards the end of the story but like that that he feels as though Dumbledore like thought that he deserved a go yeah. at, at Voldemort if he so desired. And then of course all the obstacles that are in the way are all things that Harry happened to learn that happened year to learn, you know, which, yeah, like um, look at these challenges set up perfectly for Harry, Ron and Hermione. What are the odds? Oh right, my yeah. God. The other, here's the real giveaway that Mrs. Figg's leg breaking quote unquote isn't real or is staged or not real. Okay, right? Because Mrs. Fig is genuinely a part of the Order of the Phoenix and she knows Dumbledore and she lives where she lives because Harry lives there. Yes, right. Yeah, very she, intentionally. Yep. The cats she raises. This is like a little more like out of uh, extra universe reading, but they're actually half measles, so she's actually breeding magical creatures. Yep. But here is the thing: there's no reason for her to have a lengthy broken leg, 
right? This is a solvable thing. This is a solvable thing. If Unless, you were if you were in the magical world, this should be solved like that. Right. Yeah. We know Madame Madame Pomfrey yeah. uh, is capable of mending a bone overnight. Uh, no, and, in like seconds. Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah in seconds, you're because you can regrow bones overnight. You can that's regrow good, bones overnight. Yeah. That's a good point. Um. So the the interesting question here is whether or not uh magical potions would work on someone who uh is of the blood status of Mrs. Fig, which is a squib, um, because one of the things that her house is uh, that Harry says her house smells like is cabbage, which is a smell that is off also associated with polyjuice potion. Oh, is it? It is. That's yes, cabbage is. And so that's like one of those interesting ones where it's like it's almost curious or or you almost wonder like, is there a chance that uh, there there is like a brew of polyjuice potion inside of Mrs. Fig's house all the time? Because we eventually learn that Mrs. Fig like has to make Harry stays over at her house uncomfortable for because otherwise the Dursleys never would like let Harry go and stay yeah, if he there. thought he was enjoying it. Yeah, right. So it's like Mrs. Fig is like, I, I understand I made it miserable for you. Like, and I'm, I'm sorry about that. Like this was this was like part of like what I had to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but it does make you wonder, like, is anything that's ever happening? Like, is 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 Mrs. Fig's like job like to basically like go and monitor and watch, you know, Harry, yeah, Harry. at all times, mm-hmm. like, you know, and, and like maybe that cabbage smell is just a big pot of polyjuice. That's always That'd be hilarious. Always. On but brew. like even that like, it is curious whether or not potions would work on muggles, but actually I think they would. I think they would because the idea, the idea, at least Dumbledore's theory, whether or not he's correct in his theory is that Marope Gaunt uses a love potion on Tom Riddle. Wow. What yeah. A, yeah what a, that's a good point. Yeah. And, and realistically, even uh, eventually Fred and George's, I mean, it's not a potion, but it's still a magical creation of the Tun Tun Toffee yeah. works on Dudley. So that's true. So it, it feels like that would work, but either way, a broken leg would be just a spell. It wouldn't even be a potion. It'd that, be, you know, that's like, a good point. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah. Like this is, this is like a, like a, a for, for a wizard, especially where teleportation is not beyond the realm of possibility. It's like, like Mrs. Fig could just write to Dumbledore and be like, Hey, I had a bit of a malady, bit of a malady. And yeah. it's like, and it's not like, Oh, this happened this morning. And so Dumbledore or someone hasn't gotten there to fix it yet. It's like, there's days later when he goes to visit her and her legs still broken. So it's like, it's broken for, it's like, Either she's faking it or it's allowed to be broken for an amount of time, like when it does not need to be. Well, and anyway, so the 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 more important aspect of this is is we know that Dumbledore is known for having some good guesses, and uh, on some level, we we I, I think it's with I, I don't think it's a reach to suggest that. Uh, we we know that Harry's trip to the zoo ends up being very important, very relevant, um, you know, to his journey. And, and t- we basically learn about a very specific ability, which is his ability to speak to snakes in this moment. Um, so it, it doesn't feel like a reach to me to think that Dumbledore just simply arranged this or it was just simply a lie and, and like she's just wearing a fake cast or something oh, yeah, like that, yeah. you know, like she just didn't actually break her That's leg. Well, because there's another thing in here. I think later it says like, oh, ever since she broke her leg, she wasn't very fond of her cats anymore. And it's like, I, that's not true because one, like they're, they're part of what she's like. That's her job. She breeds the measles. Right. So it's like I don't think there's a situation where she's less fond of them ever. Um, so anyway, yeah, I think I think the whole Mrs. Figs has a broken leg thing is a huge farce by Dumbledore <laughs> to get Harry to the zoo. Maybe not because maybe just to even see. Maybe Dumbledore has like an idea that like I need I need to see what happens when Harry's near a snake. And we're going to make that happen. We're going to make that happen. Um, yep, yep. Yeah. So let's see. Oh, this is a funny one too. Um, another thing they try to do is they try to uh, send Harry to Petunia's friend Yvonne, uh, someone who could watch him so he doesn't have to come to the zoo because God forbid <laughs> right, that he come. <laughs> but she can't. Yvonne can't watch him because she's on vacation in Majorca, which I just think is hilarious because literally in the next book um, when Uncle Vern is trying to close his deal with Mr. Mason. His his plan is to close the deal and then buy a vacation home in Majorca. Majorca. So it's Majorca. Is that what is it? Is Majorca. It Majorca? Oh my gosh, I'm saying it so wrong. I, th- I think it's okay. It's okay. It's, yeah. Jim Dale says it as Majorca. Does he really? I okay. Think so. Okay. Okay. That's well. Then maybe maybe it has double pronunciation. But I think Majorca. it's in Spain and it's a soft J. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Majorca then. And I just think it's really funny that it comes up twice and that it's like clear to me that like in my mind there is no doubt that the reason the Dursleys want a vacation home in this spot specifically is because Petunia's friend Yvonne has one and it's like one of those like, oh, this is a real one-upsmanship by them. 
is oh, what yeah. it feels like. Yeah. That like we oh you have a vacation home in in Mallorca. Well, guess what? Move over. We're, we're, it's we're a real- getting one, and it's also going to have a pizza oven. So <laughs> you know. keep it up with the Jameses. That's right. Keep it up with the with the Yvonnes. No, so, that's hilarious. Anyway, Although that's I, I I literally highlighted Yvonne's name and just wrote trivia, and it was like <laughs> this is like one of those questions where where if it came up and it was sort of like can you name Petunia's friend who is on vacation in Mallorca and therefore cannot watch Harry? I feel like yeah. nope. Yeah. Well, now. <laughs> we can now, now we, we can. know the real reason they want a vacation home there is because Yvonne does because Yvonne. Yep. yep. There we go. Okay. There so we go. Let's see here. The, uh, the next big thing. Uh, yeah, we've got, let's see the, uh, the eventual trip, uh, the, to the zoo. Yep. And I think one of the things I wrote down was the sheer volume of ice cream that Dudley consumes on their trip. Like does he? you have two, pa- uh, two, two, paragraphs that are back to back where it says the Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the oh, entrance. You're right, yep. And then literally the next paragraph, it says Dudley had a tantrum because his Knickerbocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top. Uncle Vernon bought him another one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like in two paragraphs, okay. he's had three different servings of ice cream. I know. Okay. I also looked up a Knickerbocker glory. Did you look up what it is? I absolutely did. Yeah, yeah. absolutely did. Yeah. It's huge. It, it oh, is yeah. a big British sun. Day. It is a, yes, yeah, yes. So, th- but this is this is one of those things, um, and, and I, I think like so often it's very interesting because we, we've asked the question a million times, but like you know, is it British or wizarding? And this is like one of those things where like on my first pass of the story, Knickerbocker glory would mean literally nothing to me at all. Oh, I, I, know, I, I yeah. would have no idea what that was. Yeah. But I mean, you of course have the <laughs> so the, much ice cream. the the context like one one se- like word later that's like it didn't have enough ice cream on top, so it's like okay, clearly it's a dessert of some kind. <laughs> it didn't have enough. That's funny too because all the pictures. I look like it looked like it was nothing but just a giant glass thing full of ice cream. So it's like apparently this this one didn't have enough. So get another one. Right. It's like my 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 giant flute of ice cream didn't yeah. have enough ice cream in it. So we, we got another one full of ice cream. Well, yeah. Like oh. Oh, okay. I guess uh, Harry really looks out though because he gets a lemon pop and at least um, the what remained of the first Knickerbocker glory. So great day for Harry all around. Yep. Yep. At least, uh, at least there. But then we move to the reptile house where uh, I think it's very, like, it's very on purpose that like the snake is just sitting there. It can't move. It's trapped in the stage and like Uncle Vernon's rapping on it and it's just people bothering him. It's like the exact same as on Petunia bothering him under the stairs. Oh, it, it's the yeah. exact same. I think yeah. the, the chapter literally begins with Aunt Petunia um, like banging on yeah. It's a, oh gosh. She's like, yeah, she, she's just banging on the door. Yeah. You know, as, as he's trying to get up. Anyway, yeah. So it's yeah. just like, yeah, there's a very obvious definite intended parallel between Harry and the snake. Yes. And it's like, not only, it's not just that he can talk to him. It's that he like relates to the snake. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Which, which even that is sort of interesting uh, in a lot of ways because like his, you know, snakes in the story feel like they live on the other side of the diagram, so to speak, yeah. like like more commonly associated with Slytherin, which is more commonly associated with with like negativity or dark magic or evil. But in this particular case, it's like Harry is using an ability that he has baked into himself thanks to the piece of Voldemort that lives inside of himself. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, that is the only reason that he's able to to communicate with snakes in the first place. But in this capacity, it's like he he's like seeing uh, more of uh, I uh, in what I would say is more of Harry's own true self, not the the part of Voldemort. Yeah, inside you're of right. It, it is interesting because the um the snakes that Harry interacts with the most via his ability to speak to snakes are the basilisk and Nagini, yes. which are like magical snakes. And you can, you can easily forget that like, Oh, maybe it's like I can, it, it can feel like Harry can just talk to like magical snakes or that snakes are inherently magical or something, but it's like he could, Harry can talk to any snake and any snake would, what, this is what I noticed this time reading through it um, on the hardback is that uh, Harry's just staring at it and the snake suddenly opened its eyes slowly, very slowly. It raised its head until its eyes were on level with Harry. It winked, which is like at this point, Harry has said nothing to the snake at all. He's just looking at it. So there's like, there's like an aura almost being given off by Harry. The snake can immediately tell this person can talk to me. Yes. It's like it suggests that like 
all snakes, even a snake bred in captivity, is aware of magic or something. Which, which is, yeah, which is weird. It is. It's pretty fascinating. It really yeah. is. Um, and I, I, you know, I think to to borrow a line from Name of the Wind, I think that there's like a like being truly alone, like even being in a room with like an unconscious person or something is is different from being truly <laughs> alone. And and I feel like this is like, or maybe even like that that sensation you might get, like where you know uh, that somebody is is watching you. Right. It, it's almost like it feels like the snake is like encountered like this sensation of, of some kind. It's like, wait a second. Like, someone, wait a minute. Yeah, someone near me can communicate with me. It's like someone, right. someone like like minded or something. I don't even know. Um, but you're right. That is that is a very interesting one. I caught that as well as I was like, it's so fascinating that like it actually seems to be of its own accord just simply kind of like reacting to Harry's own presence. So. Right, like yeah, Harry just being there alerts the snake. That's that's really interesting. And surprising snakes haven't like sought him out in any capacity before now almost. And, and again, you can go back to the, the little thing about the spiders there. Like this, like you're getting a lot of backstory about like little weird, uh, like unusual happenings that Harry has gone through mm-hmm. uh, throughout some of his life. And, and this is, these are things that we know again from like further reading in the Wizarding World that like as, um, uh, like as young wizards are are growing up, they are basically able to like their their emotions effectively can can create magical effects because they are like sort of inadvertently like directing their magic at something. Uh, and so we get a bunch of those examples, like where he gets like stuck on top of the chimney. Oh, yeah, or, where he apparates. Yeah, he's, he <laughs> yeah. essentially has to apparate. I know. I love that. I'm like, oh, Harry just Loki apparates right here. He's just like up on top of the school and he's like, the wind must have caught me. And it's like, come on, Harry. I, I, I literally wrote, okay, I highlighted uh, Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in mid jump and I wrote LOL. No. Apparate. <laughs> 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 uh, Sorry. <laughs> question mark. I know. Um, but yeah, so so but anyway, I feel like you're right. Like it would have made sense instead of having like the spider situation like to to have like regaled us with story itself of like you know at, at one point in time Harry was punished because a group of snakes scared off a bunch of kids at the playground like it would have seemed like such an obvious like thing but maybe it would have been too too on the nose too obvious. like yeah, with, with yeah. what's to come anyway uh, but it, it wouldn't even surprise me if like w- without it ever being mentioned without us even knowing if it's canon in my mind it's like that probably happened yeah you know um, what like the they were out there they were finding him they could tell if anything I would count that as a more likely reason that Harry otherwise seemingly had no friends whatsoever at school because it says like nobody would be friends with Harry because like nobody wanted to go against Dudley and it's like I'm sorry but like kids are I mean kids do not have that kind of beholdence to the class bully. Oh yeah. Like, like it's there's like, no chance. Yeah. The, someone yeah. was kind enough to be Harry's friend. Yeah. You know, and, but like, you know, I mean, if he's, if he's summoning snakes everywhere, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, yeah, it's not, it's not Dudley Harry. It's the snakes, it's bro. The, yeah. It's like, you got to chill with the <laughs> but snakes. But I guess Harry never realized the snakes were there or something. I don't know. Maybe not. The yeah. other thing about the snake that we can bring up, cause I know this is like one of those very common fan theories that I think was like a meme somewhere along the way that caught oh, a huge yeah. head of steam uh, is basically just that the boa constrictor that Harry talks to uh, at the zoo in, in during this particular scene eventually goes on to become uh, the snake Nagini. Uh, this is just something that we know for a variety of reasons to just be inaccurate. Um, yeah. I don't think that uh, Nagini is a breed of snake that can be named. It's just sort of like a magical uh, snake, which we of course know comes from um, Nagini being a malediction, hey. yeah, uh, which is basically a human who has a curse uh, that's or blood curse, right? Blood curse, yeah. Uh, that slowly transforms them from human to um, creature. Yep. Uh, we never get the full the full story as to why Nagini eventually goes on to support uh, Voldemort in the future, but we know yeah. that at one point in time, Nagini was in fact a human person, and this snake was uh, born. Red in captivity. It's also heading to uh, Brazil. So <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So unless it takes a, uh, a hard left into Albania to find Voldemort, which obviously it doesn't. Also, I, I want to say this. Does it say the snake is male at any point? I don't know if it does. Yeah, um, I don't know that it does either. It yeah. Does. yeah, doesn't matter. OK, it's not that snake. So if you've if you've been under the illusion that this that this snake that Harry sets free goes on to be Nagini, it is not. Um, then so that's sort of what happens at the zoo. Oh, he makes the glass disappear, which is really funny. I think it's like all these crazy things keep happening. They can't find where the glass broke. Oh my gosh, what happened? Um, so Harry does a little bit of magic, um, but then the the last page of the chapter here has um, him talking about how whenever they're out, like like stranger strange strangers seem to recognize him, like people in violet top hats and in emerald robes and purple. Like I, I noticed in the first couple of chapters, whatever like 
the um the Dursleys or Harry see witches and wizards on the street in the wild. They're almost always wearing purple or green, which is just like random. I don't know if those just seem like the most non muggle colors or something that. Yeah, no, that is very interesting. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, this is this is like one of those things where very, very, very little to go off of. But the bald man in a very long purple coat does seem to fit uh, Kingsley Shacklebolt at least on the Ooh, basis of how he's dressed, which is, yeah. it just kind of makes me happy to think that like Kingsley may have like also been like watching out for him because Kingsley's mm-hmm. always had that, like that air of, of, of like goodness, confidence, um, like, uh, is very capable. So yeah. it's like just the idea uh, on some level that like Kingsley would ever be like watching uh, like over Harry from afar and even like take a moment to go over and like shake his hand and just like, you know, like, Yo, what's um, up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, because he walks away without a word, and even that seems like very, very Kingsley. It you know, does. just like walk up, like shake your hand. I All know. Right. It's, it also talks about how every time he meets someone, he like they seem to vanish, which is also interesting. Like everyone who meets Harry is like, "All right, time to go." Oh <laughs> yeah, right. pop. And it's like the like early on apparition seems like it was like a lot quieter. Like it's always described with like a pop or a snap later on. And it's like early, but whatever, like when Dumbledore arrives, it just sort of, he just sort of appeared out of nowhere. There's never like a pop or a snap or all these people are like apparently meeting him and then exiting without like the loud crack sound. It's just like the, and we're gone. You know, this is one of those things that I would say that like, I, I can never really get a firm grasp on like throughout the story, like when it says like there's a crack associated with it, I can never really figure out like, like, cause I feel like sometimes it's like, like a car backfired and it's like, if, if it's cracking like a car backfires every single time, yeah. it's like that is a very, very, very noticeable noise. Yeah. Like you're right. Sometimes it is almost like it's so loud. Like when Dobby does it outside of the window, it's like, yeah, it's like a car backfiring, but then other times it seems it's more like just like a snap sound or something. I wonder if it has to do at all, like with the, the, the brand of magic that's being used or like the, like how capable the, the wizard in question is or something. We'll, oh. we'll have to keep our, our <laughs> eye to the ground to see if there's I mean, like any, any, you know, uh, consistency whatsoever. Cause eventually we'll, we'll see in like order of the Phoenix that like Fred and George are operating like into the room and, yeah. and, and surely that's the kind of thing that like, um, you know, if, if Molly was hearing them like crack from, from one level to another, she'd be like, yeah, no good. Yeah. She would say something about yeah, it. She would say know? something about it, but yeah. it does seem like they would be the kind of uh, operators who would like really try and have a loud crack. Boom! It's like, I am here. I also, I think if I had to guess, this would be my reasoning is that the, even though it accomplishes the same thing, house elves operating versus wizards operating is like actually subtly different magic because like the house elves are able to operate inside of Hogwarts, even though wizards can't. So it must be a little bit like whatever blocks wizards from doing it doesn't block house elves. So it must be different. So I think maybe, maybe it, is it described that maybe just the house elves are really loud, whereas the wizards are more of like a pop. Maybe that could be the case. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, there's, there's also Malfoy Manor. We'll eventually know that, um, you know, other, other adult wizards are incapable of operating in or out of, uh, the basement, but Dobby is, yeah. is able to get in there Dobby's as well. Like, so, whatever. Don't um, care. I used to live here. You could, I wonder, I mean, speaking to like the subtlety of the magic, I mean, again, I think it's probably different brands altogether, but, um, you know, uh, Dobby is using like wandless magic altogether, which uh, you, I suppose there's some, some possible argument to be made like that a wand helps you direct, uh, your energy more specifically, or like maybe it's like a more refined version mm-hmm. of, of the spell. Yeah. And so maybe, maybe like it's more raw. You know, oh, when, sure. Yeah. When Dobby's doing it. But like, we also know eventually that house elves are incredibly powerful of their own accord. So yeah, you know, that, that would certainly, that would certainly track, but anyway. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think chapter two is, is sort of interesting. I mean, on the whole, I would say my, my key takeaways from it was, was largely to give you uh, while we, while, while I always recollect in the first book that Harry's time spent with the Dursleys is a long time. It feels like this chapter is really covering a lot of the bases to kind of give you the idea of what his treatment was like while he's there. You yeah. Know, like the fact that he lives in the cupboard, the fact that it's even common for them to like lock him in the cupboard for uh, like, like stretches of time. I think at one point it says a week. And I want to say in the next chapter, there's one where it's like a month or something. <laughs> right. And and this is like one of those things where it's like, I don't like when you say 
trapped in there for a week. I mean, like, does that mean that the door is locked and you can't exit or is that being like grounded in your room and it's like, okay, you need to go and spend like when you're at home, you're in your room. Okay. Yeah. Not to, not to get too far ahead. Just as the first page of the next chapter, it says by the, the, this is for the vanishing glass situation. It says by the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started, which so for reference again, Dudley's birthday is June 23rd, right? And I was looking up when do summer holidays start and school end in like uh, UK and it's mid July, which also tracks for like how close the next chapter is to like Harry's birthday, which is at the end of July, July 31st, July yep. 31st. So it's like if he was in there from June 23rd to mid July one, that is absolute crazy levels of abuse. Oh yes, like yes. just nonsense like that is horrible. Like there's Harry should be so much more messed up. Oh yes, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. I mean the, the the fact that he yeah that he comes out the other side, you know, like I mean, I don't know. It's just, I mean, he's been through a lot. He's been it is, through it is not a, a good life. It also yeah. means like in some capacity, he was just kept out of school for like almost a month. Basically, like it seems like the Dursley should have been called out on that. It makes like maybe he was at least going to school and it was like as soon as he got home, he's in the in the, that's not there's no at least there. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just all bad. It's not none of it's okay. It's I know, so bad. I know, I know. It's like you want it to just be like hyperbole or something. You want it to just be like, but like, it's like it's you like, want it to be, but like that's what it says I know, on the page. I know it's like well that's that's not great. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah. yeah so so dif- difficult life, difficult uh, life for Harry coming up on his eleventh birthday here. Um, ben, what did you think of the chapter art for the Vanishing Glass? Goodness gracious. I mean, it infuriates me to look at it a little bit. I yeah. mean, you know, he just like, I, like Dudley just just does have that look in in the chapter art here. So if if you can imagine, uh, you got you got little little dudders there surrounded by a pile of presents. But really, it's not the presents or anything else. That it's it's just the expression on his face, which just is it is such an air of superiority. It is. It's like um, I deserve all these things. Like even as they're describing what his particular like batch of of gifts happens to be like there's the inclusion of like a racing bike you know um yes and uh, like a second television and you know it's funny because it's like I'm, I'm sort of just like imagining the most like comical like from how the grinch stole christmas pile of gifts you could ever imagine and and it almost seems like that's almost exactly what it is it's like some of these things are just useless to him it's just it's an impressive looking pile of gifts yeah so it's like are like is he going to use a racing bike it's like probably not but like it makes it makes the presentation of the gifts seem that much more uh, extravagant. But the other funny thing about it too, as well as we get a further breakdown of um, what the rest of his gifts happen to be. And I I always think it's funny because it's like, as he, as they're, as they're given the rundown, it's sort of like, uh, let's see here, the racing bike, the video camera, remote control airplane. And then it goes, so it's like really specific stuff. And then it's, 16 new computer games and a VCR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, okay, we can't give a list of everything. So a bunch of games. Yeah. A bunch yeah. of games. I want to say, is this, is this a chapter that mentions a PlayStation? I don't think this is the one that this mentions the, one. the PlayStation. I think it's a reminiscence at some point in time, but it is an anachronism. I yeah. know uh, in the story where the PlayStation had not been, Whenever it's referenced, the PlayStation had not actually been released. Yeah, um, attached to this time frame yet, which I this is something we haven't really talked about before. And I will say, when I was reading the stories for the first time, kept baffling me a little bit. Was I think what would it be in 1997 when the first book was released? Yeah, um, it, I think in my mind it did sometimes. It, it sometimes blew my mind because I was close-ish in age to Harry as I was reading each of the installments, yeah. like sort of like, so we were kind of progressing it. Like it's just similar. happening in the past. It's happening in the past. So I think one of the things that did throw me it very rarely and occasionally did this ever actually have like plot relevance, but you know, the fact that you get to the end of Harry's saga and it's only um, like 1998. Yeah. I think by the end of the story, similarly, because like, I think my science fair project, for example, when I was in seventh grade, I made the mailbox 2000, which was a, a mailbox that had like a sliding drawer so that you could like reach the mailbox yeah. from, from your car easier yeah. uh, with, without having to like reach so far in there, but like I 100% stole the name from the Nimbus 2000. Oh, that's so funny. Um, you know, and it's oh, like, right. like, it's like why the is it called Nimbus it? 2000 shouldn't be called that. Right, right. But like at the time, at the time of reading about the Nimbus 2000, like, like 
the year 2000 was upon us. Like right. the, the, the number 2000 felt very prominent for one very obvious reason. Exactly. But for Harry, it's like nine years away. Right. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> like yeah. We end the whole saga and it's still not the year. It's 2000. still not the year 2000. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, there's really, there's no reason it should be called the Nimbus 2000. Yeah. Just no. at all. None Although whatsoever. they go on to do the 2001. <laughs> it's uh, yes, like, yeah. was, I'm sorry. Was there the Nimbus 1999? Like I doubt it. Right. Right. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Is this um, actually model number two thousand? What, what are not. your thoughts on the chapter art? Oh, I think I mean it's it's it just it's such an annoying looking little kid. <laughs> it's like I feel like he just looks so spoiled, the smug. He's just so smug, so spoiled. So like uh, this, it, even this isn't enough. Even though I'm surrounded, I, I I think his haircut. It's like that is how it's described, but I always think of Dudley as how he's presented in the movies, which is different. Like he's got brown hair in the movies, and he definitely has blonde hair in the books. But yep. yeah, yeah, it's just like I just. I don't uh, you get the idea that this is not a likable child. So yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty solid. It's pretty solid. There we go. There we, there go. we go. Okay. Well, so I think, I think we're at a, a great point for, uh, for, for chapter two. I feel like we covered a lot of bases, um, you know, kind of a, kind of a, a like a, like a building chapter. I feel like, but yeah. I'm, I'm excited for, Chapter uh, three is a big one. Chapter three, the letters from no the one. The letters um, from no one, except I. Idea. <laughs> I abs. I absolutely love the, the, this upcoming chapter, so I'm I'm very excited to to delve into it and to break it down together and and sort of go through all the bits as Harry starts getting his letters to Hogwarts. The thing that all of us wished as kids that someday we we, we always just assumed they were lost in the mail. I know, right? Maybe one day. Part of me is always like, maybe. What if you don't find out you're a wizard until you're like forty? You know, it's like. <laughs> Like maybe in the book it's like eleven, but like in real life, you know, they want they want grown adults who are like mature, who have some experience before they start handing out magic to people. Exactly, okay? you know what I mean? Yeah, right. yeah, Come yeah, on yeah. now. Yeah. So anyway, there's there's still hope, is what you're trying to say. Exactly. Um, I'll I'll try not to put you on the spot here, but I do <clears> see that you're that you're pulling something up on your phone. Is there a chance that you can grace us with a few verses from? Yeah, I was thinking maybe we would. I was pulling up the Peter Pettigrew rap here, so I can. Uh, I'm not going to do the whole thing. Obviously, if you want to say the whole thing, you're up on YouTube, um, but I can I'll, I'll give you the um, the the the, the, my favorite part that I actually still that led me to the whole thing and that I still actually can remember because so much of it I don't remember at all, but I always I can still remember this part. Are you ready? Okay, lay it on us. All right, here we go. This is the 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 idea is that Peter Pettigrew has a son who's Pierce Polkus ready because um, I'm pretty positive Peter Pettigrew put a permanent pause on his paternal power. Basically, he found a woman to deflower, then ran like Snape facing a shower, which, sorry, Snape didn't mean to throw shade, just trying to say anything to stop people from thinking about Peter getting laid. Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I am Ben Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands, dust off your broomsticks, and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 3, The Letters from No One. Oh man. Okay. So things things really starting to heat up here in the old Dursley's house at number four Privet Drive. They absolutely are. I love the way like the chapters sort of like progress here where it's like, all right, Harry's there as a baby. Here's Harry as just this is the progress update, and about now it's like the wizarding world is coming for him. Yes, like they're not there yet, but they're coming for him. And it's like, what's happening? This is fun. I know, like the the, the mystery is starting to build, and I, I'm both blown away and like I don't even know, like surprised a little bit because I feel like the the pacing compared to uh, like reading this again, you know, kind of going back to that that sort of like first ever read through as kids, you know, it felt it felt as though so much time passed before you ever discovered that he was a wizard. Like it felt like you were really I far know. in and we're, we're coming up on chapter four and it's like, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. I, know, I guess maybe even like, you know, we've talked about how like our dad would read this like once uh like we get like a chapter a week basically. And so I guess from that point of view, it would have been like, a month if it's in chapter four when you finally find it out like that, what's going on. Yes, exactly. You know, it yeah, might have yeah. been like a way what you go. What? 
<laughs> right. So, so kid us, I would say up until this point, like maybe you're not like colossally hooked yet because there hasn't been anything other than just like a lot of mistreatment of Harry right. going on. And, and so you haven't had any of the, like the, the fun whimsy of what the, the wizarding world right. is. Like you yet. met Dumbledore. There was a flying motorcycle. Like he made the glass disappear. Like, was he talking to the snake? Even that we didn't talk about that in the last one. It's like Harry talks to the snake, but like you, you know, even, even when you read that the first time, like as with with the full scope of everything, he's clearly talking to the snake. But like in the moment, it's sort of like just like uh, was he sort of communicating with the snake? Did the snake really understand him? You know, it, it's definitely not clear at this point in time whether or not that is uh, unusual magic or because I mean the same way like a lot of the the other magic that Harry has performed up until this moment um, are spells that he doesn't learn for years to come. Yeah, and, and you know, apparition is something uh, specifically reserved for. Uh, 17 year old full grown wizards and you know Harry Harry did it as a small child and found himself on top of a chimney apparently straight so, up operating man yeah and and so um, anyway so you know you, you're just starting to get like a feel for it but I feel like the fact that you know the letters from no one really starts to give you a sense of like just how quirky this world is uh, in, in a lot of different ways there um, uh, what I like about this chapter is that Th- is the sheer passive aggressiveness from Dumbledore towards the Dursleys like th- th- the ways in which he's messing with them are hilarious because they clearly have a tons of magical ways to just get Harry the letter like there's letters that appear inside of eggshells at one point and it's like yeah. if you guys are magically concealing the letters inside of the eggshells and you know exactly where he sleeps because clearly you do why don't you just have the letters like appear on his pillow or something yeah no you know like you're you're, you don't have to go to all this trouble there is some absolute torment being directed directly at at the the dursleys in particular and and you know it really it really kicks off almost immediately with harry getting the letter and of course it is uh specifically addressed to the cupboard under the stairs yeah at number four privet drive little whinging surrey um and you know i think this is this is kind of a funny one because i um growing up forever and ever and ever and, and again it's just kind of like one of those little things where i guess like i just didn't realize uh you know what the address would look like or what little whinging was in in reference to but in my mind for whatever reason because it's delivered by owl i always sort of like even though it's spelled differently yeah in my mind i always interpreted little whinging to be almost like like there was a little bit of winging yeah. on this a per- little wingling like yeah like like the uh like the letter may may have a little whinging to it because it's been carried by owl so like i almost thought like like let me explain the reason why the letter will arrive slightly like like it's got some whinging on it from the some, owls. Yeah, because they have wings. I never knew. I never knew. Uh, I never knew that little whinging was a place. Yeah, like um, can, I, can I have a bit of a whinge? Yes, e- can exactly. Yeah, complain, yep. complain. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, I will say. So I, I know we brought this up in the last episode, but I'm going to say it again because I just I just want to put a uh, a request out to any um, London listeners out there where uh, Harry is punished from the previous chapter for uh, releasing the snake or whatever, and you know uh, making the glass disappear, which he can't explain. And it says, uh, by the time he was allowed out of his cupboard again, the summer holidays had started, which again, like I looked it up and apparently the summer holidays start in London in like mid July, which does track for sort of the rest of the chapter because we sort of have like Dudley's gang show up for a few, you know, like every day of the summer and then the letters start showing up and yes. it's like there's enough time to account for about two weeks until Harry's birthday on July 31st, but Dudley's birthday is June 23rd. That's when they're at the zoo which makes it sound like he was in his cupboard for a month and it's it's, it's too upsetting. long. It's, it's too, too long. long. Yeah. It's too long. Yeah. Although I will say there, there is a line here um, where I think that Harry uh, refers to um, the cupboard. It, it's actually when um, Uncle Vernon is in there talking to him and uh, Uncle Vernon says, no one, it was addressed to you by mistake. Speaking of the letter, of course, uh, and Harry says, it was not a mistake, said Harry angrily. It had my cupboard on it. Yeah. And there, there is this like sort of interesting little thing that I, that I love here that like, even though Harry's circumstance inside of the cupboard is, is like just abuse. Uh, like I feel like his ownership of the cupboard, it's sort of like the one thing he gets to have. And the fact that he refers to it as my cupboard is sort of like a, like it's like, 
like he gets to, he gets to own something right and if, yeah. if all you're gonna give me is my cupboard then it's my cupboard then, yeah, yeah like okay like you're gonna make me stay in there that is mine okay right like th- we agree yes yes and then yeah. and then immediately after we get uh, a, a moment that's just sort of like it's ridiculous that it took this long to get there um, but Uncle Vernon says er, yes Harry uh, about this cupboard and the when he uses Harry's uh, first name there it is the first time that any of the Dursleys have referred to Harry by name oh is it really it is indeed that- yeah. That is interesting. Um, so that's like one of those things mm, where it's like, no, it's not. I think because Dudley says, "Dad, Harry's got something." Oh, okay, maybe you're right. So maybe there's, right. there's okay. Dudley okay. using it. That that is it's just a, it's one of those instances though where it's like clearly uh, Vernon is is doing his best to try to like level with Harry a little bit here. I think more out of fear of the fact that clearly some he believes someone to be like watching them. Yeah, and so I mean it's it's probably more self preservation that it really is an act of kindness towards Harry. Yeah, he's definitely trying to act kind, but like I love this. <laughs> It's like even their version of acting kind. It's like he's not really giving him a new bedroom. He just wants to like throw off whoever's watching them. And then it, I, oh, it's so annoying that like it says the Dursleys have four bedrooms. And it's like so it's not just that they made Harry stay in the cupboard. It's not just that they had like they made him do this and they had a guest room. It's that they have two completely empty rooms in the house. It's not just one extra room they're not letting him have. It's like, yeah, we have a guest room, so you can't have that one. It's like, well, what about that one? It's like, well, that that's Dudley's second bedroom. Yes, yes. It's like, no, no. I know. <laughs> this is just yet again one it's of those such situations. such insult to injury. Yeah, and, and I feel like it's further confirmed in this chapter. We talked about it in the last episode, but like, I think that, um, you know, the question is like, do they spoil Dudley on any level like as a way to just like, like add insult to injury to how their how little they are giving to Harry. Absolutely, um, they do. Yes, because I feel like even Uncle Vernon's version of attempting to be nice to Harry on the very next page, uh, it's it's when the mail arrived. Uncle Vernon, who seemed to be trying to nice, to, who seemed to be trying to be nice to Harry, made Dudley go and get it. So it's like even in this instance where he's attempting to show kindness to Harry, he's using the exact same tact. Like he's making Dudley go get it, so it's like the way that he's like being nice to Harry is by like punishing Dudley, right? You yeah, know? It's yeah. Like, it's just the reverse. It's the reverse. It's yeah. like it's like <laughs> Vernon, go get the dang mail, just go man. Get the mail, dude. Of course, he tries to do that the next morning himself. I will say there is like a, on this note where it's like they're trying to they like go out of their way to make life's like like Harry's life difficult. Where it's not it's not just that you know, uh, we're neglecting you. It's like we're trying to make sure you have a bad time is when Aunt Petunia is like dyeing Dudley's old clothes gray, apparently because that's the school uniform for Stonewall High where Harry is about to start going to school. Yep. And it's like there's just like on one, like, no, there's no way Two, if it's a uniform, then it's a legitimate uniform that he would need to go get not just you must wear gray clothing, right? You know, right, like yeah. if it's a school uniform, it's school issued, so you'll still look like the rest of the kids, right? Yeah. So that's just how it's like they're they're just like yeah. Uh, uh, we understand we're coming up on a situation where Dudley might not be able to oppress you at school, so we're gonna make sure you look terrible. But I do love Harry's burn here, where he's like, I'm. Um, uh, he says like, uh, it'll look like he's wearing bits of old elephant skin, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yes, that's how big Dudley is. And then also Har- Harry's just full of zingers in this one. My favorite. This is one of my favorite lines of the whole chapter is when Dudley's telling Harry that they stuff people's heads down the toilet on the first day at Stone wall and Harry <laughs> responds or he says want to come upstairs and practice and Harry says no thanks the poor toilet's never had anything as horrible as your head down it it might be sick <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, oh zing <laughs> dang when go Harry oh man it, so, is, it is nice so to fun. see him stand up for himself just a little bit there. yeah 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 no that's amazing um, and the otherwise like yeah as we as we start like moving moving forward uh, we know that more and more letters by the day start filing into number four privet drive uh, where it's seems like they are just ramping up extraordinarily. Um, I, I sort of love the um, the the links that Uncle Vernon is going to because they also seem to scale uh, pretty drastically as well. There's there's like the, the scene where Harry sets his alarm to get downstairs first so that he can get to the mail slot before anybody else only to discover that Uncle Vernon has basically been one step ahead of him and slept in front of the door slot in a sleeping bag. Yeah, um, which for whatever reason 
the idea of Uncle Vernon sleeping in a sleeping bag is just like utterly impossible to me. I'm I like, know. Like, there's, there's, how big like, is the sleeping bag? <laughs> <laughs> it, I, yeah, it just like it seems like like I can't imagine him sacrificing his comfort uh, to to the level to where he would he would do this. I, yeah, it's not only that I don't think he would sacrifice his comfort to do it. It's like why would Uncle Vernon own a sleeping bag? Like it suggests the Dursleys have been camping ever, ever, and it's like I mm, I really. Don't don't think so. There's no way you even own a sleeping bag, bro. Yep, but maybe he went and bought one just maybe, for the occasion. I, I suppose that's possible. I could see him doing that. Um, let's see. There is. Uh, oh, there's some other little little notes here I have before as we move on here. First of all, I just have to take issue with something here um, in the book. Yeah. When, as opposed to uh, Harry's gray school uniform, Dudley gets a school uniform here as well because he's going to um, whatever school he's going Smeltings? to. Smeltings. Smeltings. Yeah. Couple things. One, they said that it is stated in the book that the purpose of the smelting sticks is to hit each other when the teacher's not looking. Like it's not like oh Dudley plans on doing this. It is stated as the purpose, and I'm like. Why? Why? Why would this be a thing? Is this a thing somewhere? Do our students just given sticks at any school for no reason? Like the, I don't. The, no, this this to me feels this. Th- like like uh, in chapter one, like Uncle Vernon picked his most boring tie. This this to me feels like one of those things where it's like let's make no mistakes, okay? These kids are are spoiled and they're going to be doing exactly what they're not supposed to be doing with them. And there's no ifs ands or buts about it. That is exactly how they will be used. They will be used. Yeah. In fact, they're encouraged to do so. It's right. part of it's part of you know it's part of well, being there. Th- th- this is one of those like narrator bias things though, where I feel like it's like like surely it can't be the case. It can't be. That, right. That, that in any way, shape, or form, it just feels like one of those things where it's like if you if you give a bunch of eleven year olds sticks, it's like you better believe it's gonna. It's oh, gonna I know. Amount to sword fighting. I'm like even if even if that's not the purpose, the idea that you're giving a bunch of eleven year olds just like walking sticks as part of the school culture is like that just seems like you know what's going to happen. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. Also, also Dudley is meant to look ridiculous in his school uniform based on the color scheme, which is a uh, orange and maroon and I just have to tell you what what a marvelous combination of colors they're like it's it's put under ridicule here in the book but like frankly these were my college colors <laughs> I know yeah I feel like this is one of those things where uh we we, we have grown up you know in in uh um, Southeast Virginia, where we're just 40 minutes down the road from Virginia Tech, where the school colors are, in mm-hmm. fact, uh, maroon and orange. Maroon and orange, and they're glorious. Yes, you know, yes, imagine, imagine you're looking at a at a fall landscape, and all the leaves have changed colors. These are the colors God chose to turn the leaves once a year. Okay, <laughs> people. All right, this is a marvelous combination of colors, and that it is put under such like hilarious ridicule here on, um, you know, smeltings. You know, I just, you know. I I think smeltings just gets it in terms of school colors, not the sticks. Well, yeah, the, I feel like I feel like the the Potter saga in general tends to because I mean Ron will inevitably end up having the same issue where it seems like he's okay. always being <laughs> he given maroon. like it's like he's got like maroon uh, jumpers alongside his you know like bright red hair and it's always supposed to like clash so aggressively. Yeah. Um, so I I feel like maybe this was just something from the very beginning that it was just going to be like oh yeah these these colors don't go together we all agree we all agree we all agree yeah but um, uh, I disagree heartily there you go. Um, there's also this funny uh, thing where the, I just looked this up and I f- the, uh, having read the story so many times um, there's on when Harry first gets the mail he comes back and there's a uh, postcard from Aunt Marge who is so <laughs> present in these first three chapters um, apparently Marge is ill ate a funny whelk <laughs> it's like w- two things one I love that Marge got to the point where she was ill thought you know what I need to do send Vernon a postcard to let him know and like, like, cause like she has to have fallen ill and then done it. And, then and there's the- not much room on a postcard. Apparently that's all it says. Yeah. I'm yeah. ill. Ate a funny whelk. Also never known what a whelk was before. It's a carnivorous sea snail. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, I, I also looked it up because I literally wrote a what? And a then wh- I was like, I should probably know <laughs> what a whelk is so that I can explain it. But um, yeah, so the, the, I think that the idea behind the whelk is that uh, because it is a mollusk that that requires like it's like a handheld kind of um, you need to use like a pin to sort of like scrape it free from, mm-hmm. you know, the shell. I think that it is it is supposed to speak to um, 
like like not something prim and proper. Oh, basically, but I think is the is idea. Is it because like usually if you're getting like escargot somewhere, it's like kind of a fancy place. Well, and and I think that there are versions of it, but I think escargot is not typically well, and and I could be mistaken. I haven't had a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of life, whelks, a lot of whelks. Yeah. Um. However, I I would assume that this is closer to like an oyster, maybe in nature. I mean, I guess it it, it is. Hey, like you're a, the aquarium man. You tell me what a whelk is. I don't, <laughs> look, this is another. We need we need London viewers to tell us how frequently you're eating um whelks. Yeah, it's like it's like whelk fest, you know, like I oh, mean Oh, whelk fest? Yeah, I could wow. I could see whelk fest. It does seem thing. like a thing now that yeah. you say it like that. Yeah. yeah. But I always assumed and and uh, you know, just incorrectly, but I always assumed that a whelk was like a prune. I have no idea why. I this was is what I thought, yeah, but I like think a like a dried fruit. You know what? I always thought of it as like a as like a fig, and I'm like, it's because they keep mentioning Mrs. Fig. That's probably it. And it's like another off page character as of now. And I'm like, ate a funny whelk. Okay, fig, whelk, probably the same thing. They're not even close. <laughs> Figs are amazing and whelks sound terrible. <laughs> I could be wrong. I you know what? I would try a whelk. Also, the idea of just a carnivorous snail is just upsetting to me. <laughs> yeah, you know, back in back in my aquarium days, I do remember that uh that there was a um kind of invasive snail that that could come in on some of your uh, live plants that would yeah. breed like crazy. And so we would occasionally get in a batch of what we called assassin snails. Oh. And they were car- carnivorous snails that wow. had the, that would eat your new You hired snails. hit snails. Yeah, we hired sna- hit snails. This is a real My thing. My goodness. I know. <laughs> oh, I know. Dude, I'm learning so much about mollusks today. I, well, you know, when people signed up for a Harry Potter read-along podcast, I'm sure that they were expecting lots of snail-related commentary. Look, this is, this is what... You know what? No one... I, I like to think most people have no idea what a whelk is and they're just learning right now and they're like wait a minute what also there's another little passage here that stuck out to me for the first time as i'm reading through it with the hard copy and it's after harry has been uh given the new room which i love when they send in the new letter they still call it the smallest room like they're like oh yeah we see you upgraded there but we're not under the radar you know yeah, like you we understand not... what you did you still chose the worst room right 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 it's like you you, you gave him better than uh broom cupboard yeah. however 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 yeah, we see what's happening here, but that's not what I, he's uh, examining what's in uh, the room. And there, uh, one of the items listed in the room is there was a large bird cage which had once held a parrot that Dudley had swapped at school for a real air rifle, which just like I highlighted that whole passage. It was me like, wait, too. wait, 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 wait. What is happening here? Hold on. Let me back up exactly the entire logic <laughs> what's happening here. One, first of all, first of all, Dudley owned a parrot at some point. Doesn't seem very Dursley-ish because they hate Hedwig, although that could just be on principle. That could be, yep. yep. Also, am I to believe that as a parrot owner, Dudley was allowed to bring the parrot to school, not in the birdcage, right. which is still at the house, and that when he was at school with his pet parrot, he managed to work out a trade with someone at school for a gun. <laughs> like, <laughs> why Why are live parrots and guns allowed at the school just for imagine- under 11-year-olds? Like, what is happening at this school? I, I Yeah, I was baffled by the same thing, and I literally wrote down the ex- I, I highlighted the exact same passage and was like, what? I know. Um, yeah. so, look, someone's going to say it was an air gun, not a real gun. And I'm like, I'm sorry. If someone brought it like an airsoft gun to school, also not okay. It says real air rifle. A re- it, you're it right. You're right. Words, it says real air, air rifle. rifle. That Which, sounds like a BB gun. It, it, it does. The other thing I'm going to say about this chapter on this note, because I also wrote this down, was just trivia, because this chapter is just like you could have an entire uh, trivia episode on on like the Super Carlin Brothers channel. That's just literally chapter three, like yeah. of, of <laughs> the Sorcerer's Stone, because there are so many. I mean, you've got the Welk comment, you've got the the air rifle comment. Um, like as you continue to go on, it's just like there's there's so many like weird moments where it's like, are are you serious? Like uh, at some point in time, Uncle Vernon is humming the song "Tiptoe Through the Tulips." Yeah, I'm like, um, I don't know what that is. It's like it's like I've I you know I've read this book. 50 plus times easily and I can I could not have told you with a thousand guesses that that is the song he was humming. Yeah, tiptoe to the tulips couldn't have told you that either. No, not um there's so many times in this pe- in this chapter too where I was like, "Harry, you've never received mail in your life." Like 
it says the cupboard under the stairs. Why didn't you open the letter in the hall? Like, it, dude, come on. He, like, he laments that fact. He does. I mean, he, he does, does but... lament it. It still feels like it was too obvious. Um, after he gets the room, he also there, it later says that the repaired alarm clock rang at six o'clock. This is part of his plan to get down there. I just love that Harry is like not just a regular wizard, but a tech wizard too. <laughs> just <laughs> repairs an alarm clock. Like if you know, if my alarm clock broke, that's it for that alarm clock. But not for eleven year old Harry wizard <laughs> who clearly busted out his uh, his his soldering iron. Yeah, he's like, like, I'm right. going to fix this. this. I need to make sure easy peasy repair. I want to make sure I'm up early so I could experience as much of my life as possible right. with the Dursleys. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's that. That's that. Moving um, on. Yeah, so moving on. So we're having more and more um uh, letters arrive there. There is a reference and it's one of my favorite movie moments, but it, it's like when you see uh, Uncle Vernon sitting there on Sunday and he's just clearly so like whizzed, you know, from this whole week. I mean, he's like he just got like all of his hairs going every which direction. I mean, he, he's you, you yeah. know what I'm oh, talking yes. about. Yeah, he, he just feels like he's just like he's really lost at this yeah. point in time. And he's like, what's so great about Sunday? It's like <laughs> no, no post. post on Sunday. Very good, Harry. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yes, I love that. I also love there's a right here where she He's um like where he is nailing up the mail slot and Petunia's like, I'm not sure that'll work. And he's like, oh, yeah, it's like I love how Petunia is just like, yeah, this is we're going to have to do it's like she's already I think she's already like accepted like there's no way we're stopping it. Like um, we, we I, I'm with you. We'll try. But like that ain't going to do it. <laughs> right, right. So do you have any thought in your mind at all? Because like one of the things that does surprise me the most and, and, and at some point in time, I do think that again, this this sort of like idea surfaces but it's like it's so surprising to me because clearly they have witnessed harry undergo lots of like magical related things i mean case in point the boa constrictor that he just was punished for yeah. an entire month for like like there the fact that he gets the letter this is not the first time that there's been some suggestion of him being magical yeah. and so it's like from my end of things i'm like why do the dursleys not just be like great go I to know, that get school out of here. like you know they clearly don't like him you know and it's like if he goes then they they're not going to have to like tend to him or look after him or anything it's like he'll be gone for you know like 10 months of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, it seems like their summers are only like eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, this is, it's like in, in my mind, I'm like, why are you guys going to such extraordinary lengths in experiencing such un ish behavior in, in, I mean, to the tune of, you know, the sleeping bag. I mean, even the eventual like hut in the middle of like, Oh, the, the hut. Yeah, there's a bunch of weird things that happen there where they're like, when they're at the hotel, they're eating like like bad food. It's like a tin of old tomatoes, and it's like why why you guys <laughs> there, have still much, like you could still present. you yeah. can still get better food. There's no reason for the food to get bad. And then like when they go to the island, it's like I've got some rations, and it's like four bananas and four bags of chips, and it's like wh- why. Why do you get bad food? I don't understand. <laughs> you have money. Just, like, it's just insufficient <clears throat> food. Yeah, I, really, is yeah. what it comes down to. It's like it's like that was an, like surely Vernon. You understand that was never going to be enough. I know. Like, like it, <laughs> uh, how long are you planning on staying there? This is this is very not enough. I don't understand. And like like clearly he makes a lot of money. So I I don't know. Yeah, uh, yep. that's sort of a weird one. I think there's uh, one of the things I circled here was when the letters start arriving in funny ways. So he nails up the mail slot and then the letters start arriving like pushed under the door slotted through the size and like forced through the small window and I'm like just how are the owls doing that (laughs) is yeah, this is this is where like I, I'm just sort of assuming that like like magically and and this is like where you're wondering like who is involved or is this just sort of like the byproduct of like anybody who tries to avoid such letters like yeah like would this always happen like is, is the wizarding world always going to be like mm, no you know like you need to get you need to get your letter like it's important that this yeah. happens it does seem like there's a certain amount of magic associated with like mail delivery and owls where like even later on when Harry's trying to get serious letters he can just send Hedwig and it's like take this to serious I don't know where he is and like it works it works yeah it's, yeah. Like, it's like somehow some way like there's like a homing beacon yeah. built into the right yeah, like yeah. there there is something extra there even like when they like release the letters and they go through the, the mail slot I'm like did the owls have good aim or are the owls just like I'm here and when I 
I let go, the 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 magic will take the letter where it's supposed to go. Right. I could see that. I could see that. Yeah. Um, because at some point in time, obviously, they come bursting through the fireplace. And, and similarly, yeah. it's like, you know, even if the, the owls were dropping them into the fireplace, they would just be landing like, you know, in the grate. Yeah. Not necessarily like, like, like whooshing. Exploding out. Yeah. Right. On that note, though, there's there's sort of an interesting topic we can touch on a little bit uh, because we do eventually learn, like, like you might ask the question, like, why is the Wizarding World so determined to make sure that young wizards are getting their letters and we do learn like you know in the fantastic beast saga that of course obscurus uh is is the uh, malady attached to um basically like bottled up magical ability yeah and um on some level i know that after we kind of like learned that a lot of people kind of have the question well then how come harry never really uh like established an obscur- obscurus while he was living with the dursleys where like yeah. clearly his magic was being like you know oppressed on some level or otherwise just not very accepted. Um, and that, I think that's going to be the line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that the, the big thing is that like, it's, it's like Harry, of course, and, and again, boa constrictor chimney, um, you know, his hair growing back, like Harry's magical abilities are oozing out of him. He just doesn't know what they are. He has no idea like what's going on. So they're not really being repressed. Like Harry is still actively yeah. like exhibiting. He doesn't and, even know what's happening, right? Like his magic is, is still actively coming out of him. But uh, I do feel like the fact that the, the wizarding world may know um, that that magic that does get like, you know, kind of tucked away deep within. Mm-hmm. might cause this particular malady it might be a reason why it's like mm, no we got to make sure these letters get there yeah. you know like this is important yes. um, safety precautions yeah 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 and, yeah the difference then would be like if you've seen fantastic beasts like credence is like an older character who is living in a place that hates magic and he knows that he's magical and he's like actively holding it in yes exactly. hence the obscurus hence the obscurus exactly yeah. also i do i just have to point it out there is when the we talked about the the letters coming out of the uh, fireplace and just like shooting all around the room. And it says the Dursley's duck, but Harry left in the air trying to catch one, which he doesn't. And it's like, yeah, okay. Youngest seeker, seeker in a century can't catch one of 40 letters while everyone else is ducking out of the way. Right. Yeah. can catch a, a, a yeah. speeding S- golden ball. Yeah. Mid air. But, <laughs> but yes, large parchment letter. Yeah. Uh, too much. No, I don't have the exact it. same thought. Yeah, okay. yep, that's okay though. Um, so I, cause either way, cause it does allow for the, the saga to continue, which of course is the in- increasing lengths that, that Vernon is going to, uh, to basically take his family further and further from, uh, home so that they are not able to be found. Um, one of those stops, of course, is uh, the Railview Hotel in Cokeworth. Yep. Which again, I think is a is a fun little piece of just sort of like a, just a trivia question. You could be like, where, what town do they stay in? And it's Cokeworth. Is it a, is that a real place? The Rail, the Railview Hotel in Cokeworth. Did you I, look that up? I don't think it's a real place because I think we will eventually learn through additional uh, Wizarding World reading that Cokeworth is the town where Lily, Petunia, and Snape all grew up. That's oh. where Spinner's End is. Okay, gotcha, um, gotcha. So gotcha. Lily, Lily is at, or no, uh, Petunia rather is actually uh, in her hometown. Um, while oh, they are there, which is kind of that's funny. Yep, that's funny. Also, uh, while we're on things that aren't real, the, um, later Dudley is complaining that he missed the great Humberto on TV that night. But the, I was looking it up. I was like, oh, I bet that's like a funny like British kids show from the '90s. And it's like, it's not. It's not a real show at all, and it never was. Just literally, it's I, just the great Humberto. I, I wrote that down as another trivia yep. question you could ask. Yep. That's funny. And uh, then it's this is funny too. Dudley is saying it's Monday, and Harry is like, if it was Monday and you could usually count on Dudley to note the days of the week because of television, then tomorrow Tuesday was Harry's 11th birthday. I just underlined the word usually because in fact, um, then the tomorrow Tuesday in question is July 31st, 1991, which was actually a Wednesday. So you actually cannot count on Dudley to know the days of the week here. <laughs> right, right, right. No, that's hilarious. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I think this is, again, one of those situations where it just seems like the the actual days of the week, like there, there was no basis or calendar that was being used when writing where it was just sort of like, and, and I'm sure this is like one of those things too where it's like, you know, the book probably you wouldn't have even had the expectation that the book would have gone under such levels of scrutiny oh yeah right yeah like you know it's probably the type of thing that even the editor is like you know it's like like you don't even think like oh we should probably fix this to make sure it's accurate it's like nobody's gonna care it's like fast forward like 25 years and it's like here we are here (laughs) we are this is the wrong day of the week 
Right. It yeah. totally, totally takes me out of my reading experience. I know. Like, <laughs> come on, guys. Did, like, I mean, how am I supposed to believe that Harry's birthday was the next day when the days of the week are wrong in the book? And exactly. So like, uh, like, to be fair, when you're reading this, it has not been established what year it is, but um, when they eventually establish what year it is, like in the real world, it uh, it doesn't line up. So, you yeah, know, there, there you go. You go. You have to bring um, it up. Have to bring it up. Oh, also, Uncle Vernon, while they're there, um, goes and when he gets the rations, he also comes back with a long, thin package, which ends up being a gun. And I'm like, wow, did he bring a bird with him or what he trade for that? As far as we know, the exchange rate for for air rifles is one parent <laughs> is one pair. It's like, oh, no, you stop and get a parent along the way. <laughs> um, in addition, we also get a, a line here um, where uh, we, we learned that normally on Harry's birthday, the Dursleys don't seem to forget it, but instead just give him junk, <laughs> including no, a like- coat hanger and a pair of Uncle Vernon's old socks. Um, this is just a fun little illusion because uh, years later, we'll know that eventually Harry will use these same this same pair of socks to uh, muffle a sneak scope in his trunk. And also uh, that's in his third year. And then eventually in his fourth year, he will give Dobby that same pair of socks as a Christmas gift. Yeah, which Dobby loves. Dobby absolutely loves. Yeah, yeah. pretty amazing. So um, there is that the socks do come into play. It's established early. Keep track of those socks, people. Keep, yeah, but socks in general. You know, this is like one of those things that like I, I've thought before, like what's the deal with the wizarding world and socks in general? Because like, uh, you know, at some point in time, and not to not to be too spoilery too soon, but we know that like Dumbledore claims that like what he would see, you know, in the mirror of Erised is himself holding like a nice pair of woolen socks. And we know yeah. that uh, socks are, of course, what Harry uses to eventually free Dobby. And it just seems like there's there's something about this like like kind of cozy like comfy like I don't even know like irregularly shaped like there's there's something like yeah. kind of quirky there's like about something sock. funny about socks yeah there's yeah. like there is like a something about socks is is just sort of like inherently magical right 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 yeah. yes yeah like <laughs> they're mag- present in the wizarding world right yeah so maybe that's like one of those things like where after Tom Riddle is asking uh, Slughorn eventually like isn't seven the most powerfully magical number yeah and aren't socks the most powerfully magical <laughs> clothing <garment>? yeah <laughs> <laughs> aren't socks the most powerfully magical garment I just like to think of Tom Riddle being like oddly like into socks like yeah. he's got like his whole like you know too cool for school facade but also I got some quirky socks and yet and yeah we know Voldemort when he comes back in Goblet of Fire is just like barefooting it around all over the place like it's do you think he ever wears shoes Who's, is it oh, yeah. Voldemort yeah I don't know I don't, I don't know. know you don't really see his feet after that that's a good point that's hmm. a good point maybe maybe he just he's like you know at some point in time th- yeah it's like it's like you can't think these are these are the things about like Dark Lords where it's like at some point in time he had to like tie some shoes on and it's like you can't ever think about Voldemort yeah. having to put shoes on I, like, I can't imagine doesn't, doesn't, him like, wearing fit. shoes yeah like yeah. Him lacing them up over there but you like know. imagine him like walking down Malfoy Manor like on gravel and he's like ow, ow, ow. I know. <laughs> well this is why he can fly yeah yeah, there yeah. You go, yeah. Like, just, like, quietly levitating three inches above the ground so right. he doesn't have to walk on gravel. It's like, I also can't imagine Voldemort like eating either though, you know? No, yep, 100%. <laughs> He's is like, it? yeah, like, yeah, at some point he had to sit down and have some food. Like, what do you think he likes? You know, what's he eating? It seems uh, probably like you think mollusks. he likes like Italian subs or? <laughs> <laughs> Worm down, run to the deli. Right. <laughs> Get me a Reuben. <laughs> A Reuben. I can't imagine it at no, all. I doesn't can't. sound like it. No. He sounds like he would eat something more akin to like a bowl of live worms and eyeballs or it something. It does feel that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. More of like the, the Shrek appetite. Yeah. Um, anyway, but yeah, so as we, uh, as, as we get back to chapter three here and not the Dark Lord who has definitely not returned yet. <laughs> it was definitely not eating, not using the bathroom or wearing shoes. Right. All right, things right. I can't I, imagine I Voldemort using. I didn't want to say it, but yeah. I was like the other one is like, he surely has to take a bathroom. He has to go right to the to bathroom. Get, right, yeah. yeah. Does he get showers? Right. Yeah. It's like the robes are all in the way. It's like he doesn't, he doesn't take them off. What a fuss! Even when he's reborn, like the ro- no, I guess he does say robe me. So there is that. I guess in the movies, the robes are just on him. Yeah, that's yeah, true. that's true. No, anyway, yeah. Um, anyway. So uh, yeah, as as we press forward, though, I I will say that I, again, you know, speaking on uh, Uncle Vernon's um uh use of the sleeping bag, I'm also very impressed with the fact that he finds the the shack on or the hut, you know, on the rock in the yeah. middle of the ocean or whatever and he rose a boat out to it manually rose there for, for apparently hours hours it's like i'm like 
<clears throat> honestly, not for nothing, but like rowing a boat with that many people in it, like, I mean, that's not easy. I mean, Dudley's a heavy kid, you know? I mean, yeah. And I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of like heavy wind <clears throat> and, and, you know, like possibly like some waves, you know, overhead. And I mean, Uncle Vernon is just, just as cheery as can be. So a part of me almost feels like he has missed out on his, uh, his true calling to be, you know, like doing expeditions or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Like you he's know? got some, maybe it takes so long because he's bad at it. <laughs> oh, maybe that's true. Yeah. It's like he's just like spinning in circles. It's <laughs> yeah. like 30 feet from shore. Right. <laughs> Come on, Dad. I sort of don't mind that explanation. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I can, I can, I can see that. Um, anyway, but yeah, so we we make our way uh, to the hut, which sounds just honestly dreadful. Um, you know, and, and honestly, I would say that like the idea of being on like a cool little island in like a remote hut or something like it's like I could see booking that Airbnb and being like excited to go. Oh, and stay yes, there. I know. I'm like, um, it's obviously like supposed to be this really remote, terrible location for Harry, but I'm like, I would, I wouldn't mind spending some time at this island. It seems <laughs> it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Cool. Yeah, may, maybe not during a storm. Maybe not during a storm, but like suppose <laughs> I wake up and go fishing or something. That's right. pretty nice. Not so bad in the little rowboat. Yeah, that, that you can probably boat. row better. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, I'm better at rowing than uh, Vernon. Right. Right. Yep. Um. So, but otherwise, I mean, yeah. So we're 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 basically on the eve of Harry's birthday at this point in time. Harry, of course, uh, even even under the the terrible circumstances where um, Dudley sleeping on the moth eaten sofa and Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia are sleeping on the the lumpy bed. Harry is Harry is left to find the softest bit of floor. <laughs> softest bit of floor. Wow, you know how so you know how soft floor is. Oh yeah, it's like oh, this, this is a good soft piece of this is a good soft, piece soft of bit of floor. Yeah, it sounds like it's just like it also makes it sound like it's not like wooden. It's just like a dirt floor. Yeah, yeah. Which well, I mean, you know, again, going back to the film, we know that Harry's able to draw himself a little birthday cake. That's true. Yeah. Know, so and, maybe it is just a dirt floor. Um, um I do. Yeah. Then, so then he's watching Dudley's watch as it counts down to his birthday. Day, the next day, and as it strikes midnight, there's a large boom at the door. Which, what I love about this is that it's at midnight. So to me, it's like I I like to think Hagrid had a bit of a, like a dramatic, <laughs> like a bit of drama he wanted to insert. He's like, hold on, I'm here, but no. oh, it's only like it's only like one minute. Hold on, let me just count it down. And boom. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. No, it's amazing. And and again, we went back to our, our kind of fun fact that like, you know, Hagrid had basically like left him on the Dursley's doorsteps exactly nine and three quarters uh years earlier. And it's like the fact that like it literally comes down to the second. Like yeah. it's we, we see Harry countdown three two, one, boom. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, down to the moment, um, even even when originally Haggard arrives, it's it's like right at midnight. Yeah. You know, uh, to, to leave him with the it's Dursley. It's like exactly so. nine and three quarter years yeah, that Harry just, exits the wizarding world and gets reintroduced to reintroduced it. Reintroduced to it. So yeah, just pretty, just pretty amazing. Um, and this again, I think this is kind of a cool one. Kind of go back to like dad reading us, reading us the books as kids. But um, this is a great cliffhanger, you know, chapter because there you are like, you know, you're like, okay, finally, like Harry's birthday, like as a small cage you're like i can appreciate birthdays like it'll be like that's good no matter what yeah and here we are and it's like boom like what like what happened is yeah. good things is a bad thing like right. we're you're like wondering who the letters have come from the whole time and it's like someone's here someone's here yep. someone with the letters and that's where dad would, would turn the corner of the page down and be like all right boys all right till tomorrow night and it's like what no what was the boom who is it i'm never gonna be able to sleep now i'll I probably know. spend all night thinking about theories as to who it could be i know who I have know. we met so far <laughs> no, yeah okay that would cross your mind like yeah oh it's probably Hagrid <laughs> yeah right yeah. Yeah. oh we, it's someone we've already met it's, it's probably Elvis <laughs> yeah yeah it's probably Elvis <laughs> Elvis Dumbledore <laughs> 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 oh man so exactly. um, yeah so anyway i mean i think um good it's it's a great chapter overall i mean it's it's kind of nice to uh you know after having um watched the dursleys just kind of be the worst for a couple of chapters for for them to kind of get their come up it's a little bit where it's like mm -hmm. okay clearly at this point in time like whether or not we we know to what extent these people are on harry's side it's like the like something's going on here like you know clearly Something, something is the foot. Yeah, you know, and and so it's kind of nice, like see them, see them sweat a little bit, and and you know, for for the uh, the momentum to start being like you know building, like we're we're about to kind of get get into like we're getting some answers real soon. We are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're not terribly far from more magic happening. Yes, yes, which is exactly. What we're looking forward to. Yeah, so um, we should uh, um uh, talk about the chapter art. Obviously, haven't of gotten course. to that yet. Yep. 
Yep. Um, so the chapter art for chapter three, uh, the letters from no one are is of course the the mantle, uh, the fireplace, and just just a, an absolute onslaught yes. of letters. Yes. Um, I I like how well I've just it's it's worth noting that on the mantle there's clearly a large picture of Dudley and no picture of Harry. And no, yeah, none whatsoever. Yep. 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 Keeping um, up with the canon. The the number of letters coming out of the fireplace though. Once again, go back to your point about Harry being the the youngest seeker in a century, and it's yep. like it's <clears> like. That's a lot of letters. It's a lot that's, of letters, that's a man. A lot, a lot of letters. It but sure is. Either way, I still feel like you, you can't help but call. You know, I mean, and, and I know we've we've given high praise to all of them so far, but like each of these chapters are just so iconic. Like you're you're really building into the wizarding world um, in such a such a massive way. I would say I like chapter three's art better than chapter two's art. Oh yeah, you for know, the, sure. The fireplace. Although two in a row we have Dudley in the chapter art. <laughs> that's true. I know we need to get away from that <coughs> ASAP. Yeah, um, no doubt, no with, doubt. With chapter four, yeah. you know, where we're we're of course going to be. Uh, inching our way over again into that magical world with the with chapter four, the Keeper of Keys, where we're yeah. going to get like a really awesome introduction uh, to Hagrid more as a character, learn more about him. Yes, uh, Keeper of the Keys next week, chapter four. Cannot wait for. It. But before we sign off today, Ben, I have a I have a review. Left oh my for gosh, no on way! Apple Podcast. A review. Oh man, that makes me so excited. Yes, if, if if you if you are listening and you are enjoying the show so far, we would absolutely love it if you would leave us a review. Absolutely, we're going to try and read a review. Uh, uh, in every episode, so if you leave us one, we'll 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 be reading through all of them, and uh, maybe you can get onto the pod. This one I think was left after episode zero, so it don't ha- it's, it has no commentary on uh, the first three episodes. But it is by Loverboy one two three four, and it says that Carlin Brothers equals HP experts. The Super Carlin Brothers are the literal scholars of our time for Harry Potter. So excited to go through the series with them. They have so many amazing theories and love their perspective on all things Harry Potter. Who better to make this podcast? Oh <coughs> man, that means so much to me. I oh. feel like it's it's so sweet. I mean, it's uh, you know, this is this is like one of those things like where we where we've joked, and I feel like even as we've been putting the show together, I've been very hesitant to refer to ourselves as as experts. Oh, I because know. It's like it's <laughs> like it feels like we don't have a proper education in this field. But the actual reality of the situation is that I have now probably studied these books yeah. more than any other books that I've studied ever, ever. Um, you know, including my you know my 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 double major in college. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like uh, th- this is probably like where where you know we could I don't know maybe someday aspire to to teach a course. Oh boy, you know? that'd like, be crazy! It'd be so much fun to like go through and and kind of dig through. One of the biggest things that I would say, and I mentioned this thing in episode zero, but um, I feel like really the the Harry Potter books were the thing that got me like interested in reading at all kind of like reframed this activity that I otherwise always so associated with like schoolwork. Mm -hmm. And as I got older and I was going through like, you know, our, um, as our, our our like literature classes in high school and stuff like that, and they would they would have you read a lot of these like older stories, um, you know, like like I think Animal Farm is one of the really famous ones that we read in in ninth grade, and it's all about like uh, I think like the Cold War and a lot of stuff that was going on with Russia, and yeah, and I'm sure that if you lived through those circumstances, then like a lot of the 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 you know connective tissue between each of the animals and who they're supposed to represent is like a real world counterpart, like makes sense to you. But it was like, I don't know much about these people outside of the story. So like you telling me that that so and so character is so and so in the real world. It's yeah. like it's like I yeah, I do remember having to read Animal Farm and it being like, Okay, now now in order to understand this, we're gonna have like a whole week on Russian history. See and then like, oh, oh, and see and see now, see how they were do- see what they were doing? And it's like yeah, but it's like I just this is English, so why are we having to do Russian history? Right, know? yeah. Like I, I'm learning, I'm learning both the Russian history and about this new story called Animal Farm at the same time. And so the fact that that they are connected doesn't like doesn't like blow my mind. It just sort of is like, okay, thank you for telling me that information. So I think what I loved about you know the Wizarding World and reading the Harry Potter books was that I feel like I was I was dissecting the story on my own. You know, like I was yeah. I was like finding all the like the little details and and actually like understanding you know like an author's intent in a way that I. I had never really like cared to examine in the past. So yeah. anyway, um, yeah. So great, great review. Thank you so much. Uh, again, you know, if you, if you would like to leave us a review uh, in any of the spots, we will be sure to come through them and try to include one in every episode. Uh, but otherwise, I think that next next chapter that we've got coming our way is going to be uh, chapter four, The Keeper of Keys. Yes, can't wait to jump into that one. Uh, thank you, and uh, we'll see you next time as we continue to venture through the Griffin door. 
And guys, just a quick note before we take off here, if you are watching the visual version of the episode here on our launch day on the Super Carlin Brothers channel, uh, we hope that you've enjoyed everything that you've watched so far. Going forward, we will be uploading new episodes of Through the Gryffindor to its own YouTube channel, which just goes by the exact same name. We will have a link in the description down below. If you are someone who enjoys uh, watching along with the podcast instead of listening to it on any of the uh, various podcast platforms, we highly encourage you to go over and give it a subscribe. Yeah, absolutely. Please go ahead and do that. It, or even even if you're just listening and you're you want to see what the set looks like or anything, you know, go just go give it a, give give it a look because uh, we spent a lot of time on the set and I think it looks really good. I'm really <laughs> proud of it. Yeah, we yeah. got a lot of cool things. We got our we got our uh, th this character that's over my shoulder here. In case you don't recognize him, once upon a time, I believe we were using him as uh, a Ludo Bagman artist yeah, rendering stand-in. I think so. Um, so <laughs> it was it was really funny. We were like, we want to get like a cool portrait that kind of like looks like it's like actually alive back there. Uh, and so that is that's just like a little. Uh, both Super Carlin Brothers Easter Egg and just like fun little inclusion here on the physical set. So yeah, it is. Uh, anyway, guys, again, go and subscribe through the Gryffindor. Otherwise, until next time, bye. bye.